my name is Damon Jones. I'm a faculty member at the Harris School um, across the Midway here at University of Chicago. Um, my research areas of interest include public economics, household finance, and also some behavioral economics. Um, and I'm going to be talking about tax policy today uh, and inequality. Um, before I start, I just want to sort of highlight a couple of just um, big picture observations about tax policy. Um, one is that I find tax policy to be very interesting, as you might uh, have inferred. Um, but it's also a topic that maybe makes some people their eyes gloss over. I know my father, when I tell him I study tax policy, he starts to snore and <laughs> makes fun of me. But <clears throat> actually, it's very intertwined with inequality. Um, the first thing you might think about with tax policy is raising revenue and how do we raise revenue and pay for things. But um, really, all the action when we're talking about tax policy, a lot of it has to do with redistribution. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, we have, as you may know, from like the first fundamental theorem of welfare economics or the second fundamental theorem of welfare economics, uh, if we want to raise taxes, the efficient way to do it would be to use lump sum taxes. So if we needed to raise um, X amount of dollars, we would just divide it by N, which is our population, and take that average amount from each person. That would be the least um, distortionary way to extract tax revenue. Um, and so all I'm going to talk about today is all the ways in which we don't do that type of policy. And the, the, the main reason why is because of uh, different um, desires to redistrib redistribute from one group to another. Um, you know, the one that probably is most resonant is redist redistributing from high income people to low income people, but there's tons of redistribution in tax code that goes in a number of different directions for a lot of different reasons, many of them political. Um, so uh, what you're going to see a lot is that what we're going to be talking about <clears throat> is redistribution across different groups of people. Um, the second thing you'll see is that you might think then, uh, you might have also thought that, well, the goal of uh, in public finance is to think about what's the most efficient way uh, to raise taxes. Um, and so efficiency is going to be one consideration. But the other consideration, again, is going to be about what we call equity. Um, typically, how much you'd like to give the next dollar to a, a certain individual in the population. So you see this again and again. And Actually, as I'll come back to in economics, deciding what those preferences should be over different types of people is not something that can be derived from first principles. It's a matter of preference. Potentially, it's a result of some political process. Um, and so you're going to see that a lot of the action also has to do with how much you value giving resources to one person versus another. You'll hear me talking about social welfare weights. So that is also going to be something that's going to be doing a lot of work. And when you see someone talk about tax policy, they're implicitly working with some sort of social welfare weights. And they may not explicitly be identifying those, but those are going to be key. And there's not necessarily any right way to have a social welfare weight. And so um, you'll see that a lot of the results are going to hinge crucially on what social welfare preferences you have. All right, so uh, because I have too many slides, I'm going to try to keep the pace going rapidly. So I'm going to start by doing an overview of just tax policy. <clears throat> um, and then I'll get into more uh, sort of narrowly focused examples of the economics of taxation, we'll talk about optimal taxation. And then in the third part, I'll do what I'll call some applications. So I'll talk a little bit about an even more narrowly focused area of research, empirical research. And then I'll also feature some of my own research. Um, so by no means is my research the best or the only research, but it's much easier for me to present. So um, 
I'm going to feature some of my research, uh, mainly to just give you a sense of what I do, but also some examples of how I've taken my interest in tax policy and, and then converted it into uh, some research. All right, so I'm going to do the thing that people do and start with a definition. All right, so a tax is going to be a compulsory transfer from private actors um, to the government. Um, even though the government has some you know, enforcement um, ability to sort of take what they want, there's still a lot of uh, say that the, the private individual has in this matter. Okay, so we're going to see that there's ways to um, alter how much tax you're going to be charged or how much in taxes are going to be collected from you. Uh, there are different types of choices that you can make. We have something called tax avoidance, um, but we also have something called tax evasion. Does anyone know the difference between avoidance and evasion? They sound very similar. Um, yeah. um, I would think tax avoidance is where you're trying specifically to just avoid um, specific bills, and tax evasion is you're actively trying to evade the law. So. Right, so yeah, part of it has to do with legality. So tax avoidance has to do with changing your consumption or your private actions in a way that reduces your tax liability, but not in a way that's necessarily illegal. So if um, you know, they decide to uh, start charging higher um, you know, parking rates downtown because there's Lollapalooza, you can think about that like a form of a tax loosely. Uh, if you decide to avoid downtown in order to avoid those higher parking rates, um, that is a form of tax avoidance. It's not illegal to do that. Tax evasion is the legal cousin of tax avoidance, um, where I would go downtown, park, and not pay the meter at all and try to get away with it. Um, and then we'll also see that market forces also dictate who actually pays a tax. Okay, and so we'll talk about incidents, which has to do with the idea that person who sends the check to the government is not necessarily the person who is actually footing the bill. Okay? Um, and, you know, we're going to just talk about the benefits of taxes and also the cost of taxes. Um, we're going to talk about plenty of benefits, and the main costs are going to be the distortions that these taxes introduce on the economy. They can change the number of activities that we do. <coughs> All right, so... <coughs> Let me give you just some, some summary statistics. Uh, first, I'll talk about sources of revenue. And here, I'm going to focus at the federal level to, to begin. So um, does anyone know the, the largest source of tax revenue at the federal level? Any guesses? Anyone? Anyway. Any guess will do. <laughs> Income tax. Income tax. This is correct. See? There's a return to guessing. You, know, you never know. You might get it right. <laughs> All right. So this is in the billions. All right. So we have um, one and a half trillion dollars in individual income taxes collected. And uh, this is for uh, the tax uh, 2017. <clears throat> um, the next largest source at the federal level would be the payroll tax, uh, and then we have the corporate uh, income tax, and then we have a bunch of other categories. Um, okay, so expenditures. Does anyone know what the largest expenditure is at the federal level? Is it the DOD? Department of Defense. So um, actually, the Department of Defense is about a little more than half the amount of the largest expenditure group, but it is up there. Okay, so the largest expenditure is going to be what we call entitlements or mandatory spending, and Social Security is the top one currently at almost a trillion dollars. Then we have health care uh, that we're paying for either through Medicare, which is health insurance for older um, retirees or older uh, citizens or older recipients. And then we have Medicaid, which is a uh, benefit to lower income individuals or households. Okay, there's a bunch of other programs that are basically wrapped up into income security. 
And then the fence is a, is a pretty large um, item. It's going to be the largest under this category of discretionary spending. So it is the largest discretionary spending item. And then, you know, we have a lot of debt, so we pay interest on that debt as well. All right, and if you look at these numbers, you'll see that one is bigger than the other. So we're spending more than we're raising in taxes, okay? So compared to GDP, we're bringing in about 17% in tax revenue. We're spending about 20%. So that gives us a deficit of 3 to 4%. Um, and over time, we've typically spent more um, than we've collected in taxes. There's a brief period where we had a surplus, and even then, it's not clear if we had a true surplus or how big the surplus was because some of what we did was a little bit of accounting um, magic. You'll see that there's deficits got pretty um, uh, significant during the Great Recession, uh, and then these are what this is where we're projected to go in the future, um, and so you'll see that. We're typically spending more than we're bringing in. <clears throat> it's not necessarily the end of the world if we never uh, bring in more revenue than what we spend. So, uh, you know, these things are like a share of GDP. Um, and so we can keep our debt manageable. It just depends on how fast the economy is growing. So uh, you can actually pay off your debt even if you continue to run deficits. It just depends on how fast your economy is growing. We are not currently growing fast enough to close this. So um, as you can see, there's no projected closing of this gap. <clears throat> um, a large contributor to the gaps over the years has been demographics. So we have um, an aging population, and we have rising costs of health care. <clears throat> Those are two things that have, over the long run, um, contributed to our debt um, accru accrual. All right, so here. <clears throat> You can see a little bit uh, similar, um, but over time, how our uh, spending has changed. So in this 1960, uh, nearly half of our spending was on defense. So defense was a, um, used to be the king. And now we spend all our money on health care, Social Security. Um, and so these social insurance programs um, are now what swamp the budget. Uh, okay. So that's at the federal level. You'll see things are different at the state and local level. We won't talk as much about state and local level, but um, there's a different mix of spending that happens at the state and local level. Education primarily spent, uh, the primary bulk, of, the bulk of that spending is done at the local level. Um, you can see that health is also growing at the state level. Um, for example, with Medicaid, Medicaid spending is split between the state and the federal government. Um, now, in terms of sources of uh, revenue at the federal level, income taxes have held, um, pr have held pretty stable. Uh, corporate taxes as a share of revenue have um, decreased. And then payroll taxes, which are primarily the types of taxes that fund our social insurance programs, those have grown a lot as we've basically expanded our social safety net. Most of that happening right after 1960. All right, and then at the local level, we, we rely much more on property taxes and sales taxes or consumption taxes, okay? Um, all right, and then just to give you some comparisons, this is a little older, but uh, there, there, there's a lot of variation across countries as well. Yes? Uh, just a clarification, is the payroll tax the FICA or are they two different things? So that is part of your payroll tax. Um, so that, there's, that part of your payroll tax will go towards paying for um, Social Security, uh, basically old age uh, insurance uh, and disability. Um, there's additional payroll taxes that cover like unemployment insurance um, and Medicare. It's funded partially through payroll taxes as well. Um, <clears throat> Here you can see across countries there are different mix, there's a different mix as well. For example, a much uh, heavier reliance on consumption taxes in Mexico. Um, 
And in general, developed countries have much more reliance on consumption taxes than the U.S. Uh, uh, and primarily through uh, value-added taxes, which we'll talk about. So let me um, just give you a crash course of some of uh, the features of our tax system. Um, so we have personal income tax, all right? Um, <clears throat> this is going to be tax on your earnings and your salary um, <clears throat> and other sources of income. Um, we want to make a distinction between income tax uh, so this is a broad category, but there's an income tax and there's a payroll tax, and I'll explain the difference. Um, so we have different types of income taxes. So we have taxes on corporate, corporate taxes, on uh, uh, basically on income that comes from ownership of a corporation, uh, payroll taxes and income taxes. And w when I mentioned this word incidence before, what I mean is like who actually bears the burden of a tax? Um, and so the person who is nominally charged with paying the tax is not necessarily the person that bears the burden. So, for example, with the payroll tax, um, you know, for Social Security, um, it's like 12 or a little more uh, percent of your uh, earnings up to a certain point. And you pay for half of that technically and your employer pays for half of that technically. Um, but depending on which side of the market is uh, more um, elastic or you know, basically has more outside options, uh, the, the other things in the market can adjust to shift who actually pays a payroll tax. So in the case of a payroll tax, your employer, for example, could pay half of the payroll tax but also lower your wages by the same amount. And in that case, you're effectively paying for the whole payroll tax. And we typically assume that that's what happens um, in most simulations that you see and things like that, that's the assumption that we operate under. It's not always true, but um, we tend to think that workers are mostly paying all of the payroll tax, even though that's not how it's labeled. The corporate tax, however, is way more complicated. Um, it could go to the owners of a certain corporation. It could go to all owners of capital by profligating through the capital market. It could also affect uh, labor um, inputs at a firm. But Typically, we assign it to just all owners of capital, even people who don't own shares in a company that's being taxed. The interest rate in the capital market generally can be affected. And so basically, all capital owners could be sharing it on a corporate tax. Income taxes really depend. Um, some cases, your income tax is a function of something you purchase, and then it can be, get very complicated. Um, so, for example, you could have an income tax credit for buying a hybrid car. Okay, so if you buy a hybrid vehicle, you'll have lower income taxes. That will make you more willing to purchase a car or pay a certain price for a car. If the car dealerships are aware of this, they could raise the prices of the car, knowing that it's not going to be uh, felt as painfully by you. And so, the income tax and the incident of that can become very complicated because we do a lot of things through the income tax. Um, we subsidize and tax a lot of different other types of purchases and consumption. <clears throat> um, all right, so <clears throat> with, the, with the actual income tax, which is you know the tax that you file and you fill out when you fill out, let's say, a, uh, um, a 1040, um, you show up with your income, but there are tons of things that affect what your ultimate tax liability will be. So it gets very complicated. So we have exclusions. Um, those are types of uh, compensation that aren't even included in your tax to, to start off with. Okay, so for example, uh, health insurance that's provided by your employer is excluded from your taxable income. And so that doesn't count towards your, what we call adjusted gross income. Then we have things that are called deductions. Okay, so those are expenses that you can subtract from your income because we basically are giving you the green light to go ahead and do those things. So if you put money into an IRA, which is a retirement account, in the present, you won't have to pay taxes on that income just yet. And so that would be a type of deduction. Um, you can deduct, you know, you have your itemized deductions. You can deduct certain costs that are associated with owning a home um, and things like that. 
So that's another way in which your gross income is not going to necessarily be what is taxed. Um, there are exemptions, which are basically another way of accounting for different, um, say, si family sizes. Uh, so, for example, you have exemptions that you can take for uh, yourself. Before the latest tax bill, you had different exemptions for uh, yourself, your spouse, the number of kids. They have simplified it a little. But that will also reduce your income. And then there have tax credits, and those work a little differently. The way a tax credit works is we calculate your tax bill, and we subtract credits right from your tax bill instead of reducing your income. So all of these reduce your tax liability, but they have different impacts on different types of people. Credits are more valuable to people in lower tax brackets, because if you get a $1,000 credit, your tax bill goes down by $1,000. Deductions are more valuable to people in a higher tax brackets, because if you get a $1,000 deduction, your income goes down by 1000 and you multiply that by your marginal tax rate to see how much you save. So if you have a higher marginal tax rate, a deduction is more valuable to you. Um, okay. Let me just keep moving forward. So here's another descriptive uh, figure here. This is from 2016, but you'll hear different uh, statements made about who pays taxes and who doesn't pay tax. There was a figure that was floating around who would afford it there, that said 44% of people do not pay taxes. Um, it's almost, well, I wouldn't say it's impossible not to pay taxes, especially once you think about incidents. But even without that, that number 44 is, you know, uh, misleading. So if you look at the federal income tax, it is true that there are 56% of people who have a positive tax liability once they're finished filing their federal income taxes, okay? But of that 44% who do not pay federal income taxes, they're still paying other types of taxes, okay? Um, so, um, 18, so let's see, 27% of them are paying payroll taxes, okay? So they are paying payroll taxes for Social Security, for Medicare. They are having taxes taken directly out of their paycheck. Um, and so 18% of them actually have a positive tax liability once you count that. 9% have what's a zero or negative tax liability, which means they're getting tax refunds or credits or transfers from the federal tax system and paying payroll taxes, but their, their transfers outweigh their payroll taxes. They're still paying taxes, but now they're getting a transfer. And then there's only 18% that are paying no federal taxes and no payroll taxes. That last group, um, primarily are made up of, um, most of them are elderly and very low income households. Those who are getting these credits are actually in part, um, that's, a, that's basically a byproduct of shifts we made in how we pay welfare. So we used to pay welfare outside of the tax system as a part of TANF or traditional AFDC. Uh, we cut that and we shifted a lot of that spending into the tax system. So 20 years ago, this figure wouldn't be the same because a lot of these people were getting welfare outside of the tax system. We shifted it into the tax system for various reasons. And so that also contributes to this number. Um, all right, so that is primarily your, your income that you uh, report on your tax return. The other type of income that you will report for your federal income taxes is going to be a capital income. All right, so generally you only pay income taxes in most cases, so no payroll taxes on this, this source of income. So for example, with capital gains, it's when you own an asset and it appreciates, or dividends, which is when you own a share in a company and they share some of their profits with you directly. Those are taxed at lower rates than ordinary income. Um, so this is why Warren Buffett says he has a lower tax rate than his, you know, uh, assistant. Um, other types of capital income, your IRA and your 401k, so those are your retirement saving accounts. Those are given um, basically 
pretty significant tax cuts. If you don't learn anything from this class, get some money, put it in one of these retirement accounts. They are just basically begging you. They are handing out subsidies in these accounts. So just do yourself a favor and take the money. Um, okay, so we'll come back to that. All right, so um, <clears throat> we talked about capital income, income that you get maybe from your labor. Um, another thing to think about is theoretically, what would we like to tax? We don't tax, the thing that we actually tax is a weird um, result of a number of different considerations. Economists, theoretically, what we ideally would like to tax is what's called your economic income. Okay, and that would, uh, the best way to describe that would be your ability to consume in a given time period. So let's say that you have an annual tax. Um, your economic income would be the change in your ability to consume during the year. So roughly speaking, that would be um, how much you spend plus how much you save. Okay? Um, so uh, any increase in your ability to consume technically is going to, you know, basically raise your potential consumption, and that would be something that we would, if we could, would be the most efficient thing to tax. So an example would be if you have a capital gain that's unrealized. So let's say your home appreciates. Um, so the market is doing well, and your home value increases by $10,000 this year. If you don't sell your home, you haven't actually received any uh, tangible cash for that appreciation. But in theory, your ability to consume is increased. Um, most uh, directly, you could take out a home equity loan now that you have more wealth. But generally speaking, uh, your wealth is increased by a certain amount during the year, and we would like to tax that. Um, fringe benefits, another example of something that is hard to tax, but it would be, should be counted as income. So uh, professors travel a lot. A lot of times they get, uh, you know, their travel reimbursed. Um, listen, all of this travel is not work. There's some nice things that come with it, and those are fringe benefits. Literally, they take you out to dinner, which increases your ability to consume. So um, those are things that are types of compensation that are harder to measure, but technically affect inequality. So um, ideally, we would like to tax them. There's another one that, you know, is usually hard to even wrap your head around, which is that for people who own homes, they have what is called um, <clears throat> an imputed rent, okay? So um, in the interest of time, I won't spend too much time on it. But essentially, if you own a home, you are uh, essentially paying rent to yourself. And the rent that you pay to yourself is like a source of income. Um, basically, by owning this asset, it has essentially a dividend every month because uh, you're not paying rent. <clears throat> okay? So that is also technically a benefit of owning an asset. It's almost like as if you owned a share in Apple and they paid you a dividend every month. And so by not taxing this, we're treating homeowners different than renters. Okay? Um, and so this, this basically s distorts people towards owning a home relative to renting, which is not always a good idea. So ideally, we would like to tax that as well. In practice, it's hard to measure your economic income. A lot of these things are hard to quantify. They're sometimes unobservable. So we don't actually reach this ideal, but we can always use it as a, as a, as a benchmark to see how efficient our tax system is. Okay, so um, I talked about capital gains and dividends. Um, so those are generally taxed at 15%, so that's typically going to be lower than the ordinary income tax. Um, and there is a top bracket where you can get taxed as high as 20%. Um, now, the reason why we have lower taxes on capital gains and dividends is in part because we want to avoid what's called double taxation. So... The corporation that you own a share in pays the corporate tax, and then they basically share some of their uh, profits with you, um, and then you get taxed on that again as a part of your income. So we kind of have like 
um, a catch-22 here. We don't want to tax this thing twice because that would be more distort distortionary than we'd like. Um, and so, but we also, if we didn't tax corporations at all, that would also give people an incentive to, to hoard all their money in corporations and not pay a lot in tax revenue. So these lower tax rates are kind of like a compromise between the two. That's one reason why we have lower tax rates on capital income. There's other reasons as well that aren't about efficiency. They just have to do with preferences for the types of people who own shares in corporations. Um, all right, so you can't completely explain the tax rates on dividends and uh, capital gains just by appealing to issues of efficiency. Um, <clears throat> let me just continue because I want to make sure we get to a lot of stuff. All right, so I talked about kind of like the most uh, recognizable types of taxes, which are the ones that you see when you're filing your taxes, when you're calculating your tax rate. Um, there are other types of tax, uh, taxes that are a little more hidden, but they still create incentives and distortions for us. Okay, so um, one type of hidden tax bracket is the phase out of a tax credit or the phase out of certain types of tax uh, deductions. So, for example, the earned income tax credit, which we're going to talk about a lot, that's a tax credit for low income workers um, and it supplements their income. But after a certain point, we start to phase this out. The reason why we phase it out is because we don't, we decided that we don't want to supplement everyone's income. It's actually not possible to do that unless we run a huge deficit. So, at some point, if you give a targeted, uh, if you give a transfer at some point, you have to tax it back, okay? Sometimes you can tax it back in the future, but in the present, we phase away the earned income tax credit. The byproduct of that is that once you start phasing out a credit, it creates a higher marginal tax rate. If I want to earn another dollar, um, my, my, my tax credit is going to get smaller by a certain percentage. You can think about that as eating into your next dollar that you earn, much in the same way that it taxes. So it's the same thing as being taxed. Um, and so there are certain uh, ways in which people can face particularly high marginal tax rates when they get into the regions of the tax code where they're phasing out tax credits. Um, all right, here's another example. Uh, the so-called marriage penalty. All right, so here's a quick numeric example. All right, we have a very simple tax schedule. Okay, each individual um, pays 0% on their income for the first $10,000, and then they pay 25% on the income um, above $10,000. All right, so let's say that this is actually how we tax the tax unit, okay? And there are two ways that you can pay taxes, as an individual if you're not married, or as a couple if you are married then you're taxed as a household, okay? So when I say tax unit, it depends on your filing status. All right, in this simple example, let's say you have two individuals earning $10,000, and there should be an H here, you're deciding whether to get married or not, <clears throat> all right? If they get married, they become a joint tax unit, and they get treated as one tax unit. So you can just see in this example, separately, they pay zero dollars in taxes, but if they get married, then they'll pay $2,500 uh, in taxes. So in some sense, there's a penalty for them to get married, all right? So we could say, all right, let's fix this, all right? Let's make a different tax bracket for married households. So now, if you're married, you don't have to pay taxes until you earn $20,000, okay? Um, so what happens in that case? Now did I, did I fix everything or? 
So why are you shaking your head? I think it's uh, now it's uh, got like a single penalty because of people who are only making uh, 20K. Uh, they have to like pay their own rent, but people who are married are only paying one rent with their own income. So I think it's not that changing the penalty. Yeah, so um, here with these two people, this makes it neutral for them. So they pay no taxes as single people. They get married, they pay zero taxes. But if you had a couple where, say, one was paying, made 15000 and one made 5000 separately they would be paying, you know, one would be paying taxes on that $5,000, but if they got married, then their, their joint tax liability would go to zero. So that would be a single penalty um, when you have uneven earnings within a couple. <clears throat> okay, so if you try to, basically as it turns out, when you try to reduce the marriage penalty, you kind of have to increase the single penalty. Um, and so either way, um, it's, you, you can't fix one without exacerbating the other. Okay, so that creates a tax on a certain type of behavior, which is marriage or cohabitation. Um, okay, so payroll taxes are different than uh, income taxes in the sense that they are at least um, nominally earmarked towards certain types of benefits. Okay, so for Social Security, Medicare, unemployment and disability insurance, the taxes that you spend affect the benefits that you receive in a direct way. Um, <clears throat> they're usually not levied on capital income. Um, okay, and so, but there is much more clear what you're putting in and what you're getting out. And so there are theories that say that these taxes should be less distortionary because um, as you earn another dollar and you pay a little more in payroll taxes, in the future you're going to get more in Social Security benefits. So it's not as big of a, it's not actually a pure tax. Um, so your future Social Security benefits are affected by how much you've earned and paid into the tax system. Uh, <clears throat> it's not exactly a one-to-one -one thing. There is redistribution. So for example, with payroll taxes, for Social Security, they're capped. So I think the number's around 120000 or something like that. You only pay the payroll tax for Social Security up to that amount, and then it's zero beyond that. <clears throat> so it's actually what we, would be, what we would call regressive. Does anyone know what that means, regressive? Someone tell us what that means. Yeah. Progressive is when it increases as we go higher up in the income range. Yeah, so a regressive tax would be the tax as a share of your income, so your average tax rate decreases as your income goes up. <clears throat> Progressive would be the other way around. The share of your income that you pay in taxes increases as your income increases. So by capping Social Security, that makes it regressive on the payment side. Um, but the benefits for Social Security are also capped. So that actually makes it progressive. Because after a certain point, the more you put in Social Security, it doesn't affect the benefits that you, you won't get any more in benefits. So that's for someone who has a very high income, at some point they're going to continue to pay Social Security benefit, uh, payroll taxes, and that won't increase their benefits at all. So it is progressive on that side. During, according to some calculations, the progressive part counts, uh, dominates. So it is still a, uh, on net a progressive policy. But there are some factors that could bring these closer together or, or flip it. If you think about what kind of couples marry, life expectancies across different income groups and things like that, that can affect, that can reduce this the net progressivity. Um, all right, so let me continue to try to keep on pace. All right, so with corporate taxes, um, <clears throat> they break down the relationship between your own income and your tax liability. Um, the reason why is that things are taxed at the corporation level um, without taking into account 
necessarily who the investors are. Okay, so you can have um, a, a corporation. In the past, for example, we used to have different corporate tax brackets. So you could have a corporation with a, in a high tax bracket, and you could have a very low-income person who owns a share in that corporation. They're going to be paying a relatively high marginal tax rate on, on, their, on their ownership of that corporation. Or you could have a small corporation that gets taxed at a lower rate that is primarily owned by relatively high income people. And so even though they have high income, they're paying low mar uh, marginal tax rates. Okay. Um, right now we have a flat rate nominally of 21% as of 2018 after the, the tax um, ref the tax bill that we passed in December, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, the one of the more poorly named tax uh, laws in recent memory. Um, <clears throat> the way the corporate tax works out, most of the corporations, if you look at them by number, are smaller than seventy-five thousand dollars in you know annual corporate taxable income. But most of the income comes from the very large companies that have more than like $10 million um, in, in their taxable income. Uh, we talked before about double taxation. Um, <clears throat> all right, so corporate income is a huge share of total uh, income or GDP. So it varies from year to year, but it can be as much as 75%. Um, why do we tax corporations? It's a huge chunk of the economy. As we'll talk about later, when you want to tax things, you want to tax a broad base of income instead of focusing on narrow targets. So you don't want to give up three quarters of the economy. Um, politically, it might be easier sometimes to go through corporate taxation. People tend to think of companies as something other than people, and so they like taxing corpor corporations, even though the number one rule of tax policy is only people can pay taxes. Okay? Corpor corporations cannot actually pay taxes. They don't, they're just not sentient. They're just, uh, they're just uh, a label for a group of people. Um, that being said, for uh, equity reasons, the shareholders of corporations tend to be richer households on average. So in terms of progressivity, the corporate taxation tends to fall more on richer households. Um, <clears throat> even, but then the question is, who actually pays the corporate tax? That is a hard question to actually pin down. Um, so in the short run, the people who own shares in a tax firm Maybe the ones that are actually bearing the burden of a tax. But as I said before, there's a debate of what happens in the long run. Because in the long run, you can shift your investments away from a corporation that's taxed. Whenever you can do that, when you're what we call elastic, the ways you can uh, avoid the tax, then that's going to cause the tax to be shared in a different way. And so um, the tax could fall on the workers at a corporation. Because if capital moves away from the company, the company becomes less productive and then they pay lower wages to their workers, potentially. Um, the tax could fall on the capital owners in all firms, not just in the firms that are taxed. Um, and the reason why is that now that people are fleeing from a taxed corporation, they want to place their investments somewhere else. If you are not the non-tax corporation, you now have multiple people trying to invest in you. You don't have to offer as high a return on their investment. You have multiple suitors. That can drive down the interest rate overall. And then everyone is paying for the tax, even the ones who aren't literally taxed. Um, when they do their estimates and projections, like the Congressional Budget Office or Treasury, they tend to use this assumption in uh, simulating who's paying for bearing the burden of a tax. Increasingly, corporate taxation is becoming much more complicated because of the rise in like, the international um, tax entities. Okay, so um, <clears throat> when a company has 
uh, business activity in multiple countries, it becomes much, much more complicated to decide how you're going to tax and collect revenue from those companies. Um, so if a company is paying taxes abroad and you continue to tax them at the same rate, that could discourage them from doing business in your country. So some countries offer foreign tax credits. There's a decision about what type of tax you want to have, a worldwide tax or a territorial tax. Briefly, with a worldwide tax, if the company is based in your country, you tax them on all of their operations, even abroad. With a territorial tax, you focus on their uh, profits in your country, and then they pay the taxes of the other countries in which they work abroad. <clears throat> With the last tax law, we switched from a worldwide to a territorial tax, as are most countries. Um, there are th there's something called transfer pricing, which makes it hard to tax these multinational corporations. So basically, what they want to do is, within a corporation, they want to minimize their profits in the high tax country um, in order to reduce their tax liability. <clears throat> so how could they do that? They could say, well, we're making cars, but we're building the engines abroad. Here's what we're going to do. Uh, normally, it would cost us $1,000 to make an engine. This is a very cheap car. $1,000 to make an engine. Um, we will buy that from our subsidiary, and then we sell the car for $5,000. We make $4,000 in profits here in the US, but we don't like the tax rates in the US, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to charge ourselves $3,000 for the engine. Now our profits in the U.S. went down to $1,000. Pay less taxes in the U.S. Your taxes go up in the other country, but you would presumably have a lower tax rate in the other country if you were doing this, or maybe no tax rate. And so that takes us to tax havens. There are certain countries that, in competing for business, may drive their tax rates down to zero in order to have everyone locate in their economy. And on the one hand, that creates problems for other countries who are trying to raise corporate tax revenue. <clears throat> but there's an alternative view that says it's, it's, such, a, it's such a hopeless um, task of trying to tax these corporations. Um, if they didn't have these tax havens, they might just flee these countries altogether. So maybe in equilibrium, the tax havens give these companies enough relief that they aren't just fleeing uh, your, their home countries. Uh, so there are varying views on that. But you can see, here's a picture of the average top corporate income tax rate by region and over time. All right, and the main thing you can see here, other than the beautiful colors of the graph, is that they are typically trending down over time in every region and across the world. And that's because companies are, have become much more able to do business across international borders. All right, so uh, I'm going to basically uh, intersperse the talk with some examples of empirical research and tax um, to give you a sense of some of the research that's, that's going on. So <clears throat> the first paper, and then also in doing that, I'll talk a little bit about the empirical method that they use. You can see what types of methods we tend to use in public finance. Okay, so um, there's a major tax reform in 2003. And as I mentioned before, one of the things it did was it took down the rate on the, the, the income rate, the income tax rate on dividends from, third, from the, in, the ordinary income tax rate. So your dividends were being taxed like ordinary income. They were taken down to 15%. <clears throat> and so all things equal, that makes it more um, attractive to invest in a company. Um, because when they give you a dividend, you won't be taxed as much. <clears throat> and so that might help to uh, increase investments in company, and make the cost of raising capital lower for firms, and maybe help with the economy and help growth. Okay, so in this study by uh, Danny Yagen, what he did was he compared C corporations to S corporations. Okay, and so 
uh, these two companies were treated differently um, by this policy. Um, and so basically, the smaller corporations were not uh, being affected by this policy or this policy change. And so he kind of used them as a control group. Okay, so the S corporations are the ones that are um, being uh, affected. And so uh, what we want to do is look at the difference between these two types of firms in terms of their investments before 2003 and after and do what's called a difference in difference. <clears throat> now, um, just to spoil the results, what he's going to find is that even though we had this incentive to invest in firms, um, <clears throat> we actually didn't see a change in investment. Um, and actually, if you look at compensation that these firms paid um, to their uh, employees, um, you also didn't see a change. <clears throat> so our prediction was that this would increase investment in these firms, and that's not what Yagen was finding. And so that raised a lot of questions about how we think corporations are responding to taxes. Now, here are the figures. <clears throat> if you have a nice uh, empirical paper, it's really nice when you can display your results just visually using simple graph. So here we have S corporations um, and C corporations. And this is investment as a share of capital um, using a prior, like a, the, the value from a prior year. Um, now, what you see is uh, when you want to do a difference in difference, uh, you want a good control group, and what you, in particular, you want a, a control group that has the same uh, outcomes over time. And the idea is that if this policy didn't happen, these two things would kind of move along in a parallel fashion. So you can assess that visually by looking before the policy to see that, you know, the general level of investment or the, the investment rate was similar across these two groups prior to the policy. Um, and so if we see any difference after the policy is introduced, we're more confident that we can attribute that to the policy. But what you actually see is that the difference between these two types of corporations doesn't really change much before or after. So it doesn't seem to be that this policy actually affected investment. Um, here is another measure of investment, so the change in capital. Here, these things are kind of following each other and tracking each other um, very closely. As I said, he also looked at employee compensation. So when we talk about the incidence of a tax, this is kind of like a tax cut. And one thing it could do is be shared with the employees. That didn't happen. In fact, the, the gap in compensation actually closed a little. Um, and in terms of um, payouts, uh, to uh, shareholders, um, if anything, the C corporations actually might have increased relative to the S corporations. All right, so um, <clears throat> here's another example of a study that was done that's trying to get at this question of who pays the corporate tax. All right, so this is a study by uh, Juan Carlos Suarez Serrato and Owen Zadar. Owen, um, and Juan Carlos looked at uh, who bears the burden of a corporate tax. Um, they wanted to break out the potential winners and losers of a corporate tax into the owners of the company, the workers, and then the local regional economic, uh, the local economy in which these uh, companies are located. The problem with corporate taxation is that you need, you know, to get a nice, um, you need to get nice variation in the level of corporate taxation. So at the federal level, we kind of have taxes that affect all the companies and you know, the economy at the same time. So that makes it harder to do. But what they used was um, the fact that states have different levels of corporate taxes over time. And so what they did was they wrote down a model that looked at firms and workers and how they interact in local markets, say, at the state level. And they also modeled the way in which firms and workers can relocate if they don't like the taxes that they're facing or if they don't like the wages that they're getting. And also that there are local amenities that can also um, factor into the decision that the workers make. 
So using this variation in state and corporate taxes, I won't go into the details. It's, uh, it's a nice paper. It's very technical. But their estimates say that if you give a tax cut, if a state cuts taxes, 40% of that tax cut goes to the owners of that um, company, so the shareholders. And 60% goes to the combination of landowners and workers. Okay, so some of that could go to workers in the form of higher wages. <clears throat> and some of it can go to the people who own property um, in a given area due to economic growth. And uh, this is what we call a capitalization of this value. So if, if, the, if the local economy is better because corporations have tax cuts and you own a home there, then the value of living in an economy goes up. And so some of that will be accrued to the landowners. All right. Um, and so they get different results than the classic models in this literature because they take into account that capital can move across different areas. So here's one graph that they have where they show, basically, they estimate this is what happens in a usual tax cut. Um, and these, th there's not a label here, but these are basically growth in businesses um, in, an econo in the local economy when taxes are cut. And what they do find is that there is um, cumulatively some growth in the establishment size um, when there's a tax cut. Um, and so, as I mentioned before, deciding who actually pays a corporate tax can be complicated. All right, so now I'm going to turn to a final type of tax, um, <clears throat> consumption taxes. All right, so in the U.S., as I showed in some figures earlier, we rely much less on corporate uh, consumption taxes uh, as a share of our total revenue pool than some other countries, most developed countries. So in the U.S., we have sales taxes and excise taxes that are a form of consumption tax. Everywhere else, they have uh, value-added taxes, um, <clears throat> which we'll talk about. Now, we primarily rely on income taxation. And so one difference between income taxation and consumption taxes is that uh, consumption, income taxes actually penalize you for saving. Uh, consumption taxes relative to income taxation actually encourages saving. Um, another thing about consumption taxation is that it might be more sim simple to administer. You don't have to observe people's income. You just have to see their purchases. Um, <clears throat> all right, there could be some drawbacks. So depending on how your tax is designed, it can be regressive. All right, the reason why it's regressive is that typically as a share of income, Lower income people use more of their income in a given year on consumption um, than higher income people who have more disposable income to save. And so if you're just taxing in the current period, this can be regressive. Um, <clears throat> and the thing is, is that over the lifetime, you consume your money in some way. So if we're taxing all your consumption, by the time you die, it will balance out. Um, and that depends how your tax system is set up. We have ways to kind of basically hide your money until you die and then never pay taxes on it. So it really depends on how you're going to um, tax estates and bequests. All right, so <clears throat> why do consumption taxes incur savings relative to the income tax? All right, so here's an example. Um, Here's what we're going to do. Let's say you have $1,000, all right? Okay, and you can invest it as much as you want, and you're going to get a return of 4%. All right, so now I'm going to do some board work. All right, so you have $1,000. Today, you can invest at 4% per year. <clears throat> okay. 
First question, does anyone know how long it takes you, if you invest at 4%, to double your money? That might seem like a weird thing for me to just ask you, but there's a shortcut that you can use to figure it out. Anyone know? All right, there's something called a rule of 72. It's an approximation. If you want to know how long it takes to double your money, you just take the interest rate, okay, approximately 18 years, your money will double. All right, so you can actually, uh, <clears throat> if you want to know how I got that, I looked it up on the internet, but also, <laughs> you know that you invest money over a certain amount of years, and you want it to get to $2,000. So you have compounding interest, All right? So then you just use the logarithmic, take the logs, rearrange the terms, solve for n comes out to close to uh, 72 times, or 0.72 times R, divided by R. All right, so 18 years. You invest $1,000 for roughly 18 years. Before you pay any taxes, your investment will be worth $2,000 in your savings account. All right, so <clears throat> let's look at an income tax. Let's say we have a 50% income tax. <clears throat> Here's what I want you to do. Take two minutes, somebody that you're sitting next to, figure out how much I'll have after 18 years if I have $1,000 to invest under an income tax, or at least try to figure it out. You didn't know there's going to be an in-class exercise, did you? <laughs> okay. So uh, how do I figure out how much um, you're going to have after 18 years? So what's the first step? You earn $1,000 today, what happens? Under an income tax. I lose half of it. You pay income taxes on half of that money. so. Today, you pay, up front, you pay $500 in taxes. All right, so before you, money can even be invested, you pay 50% income tax. That's <clears throat> that. After one year, what is, how is your, uh, how are you treated by the tax system? You pay 50% on your interest income. So that's another source of income. So you're going to get 0.04, but half of that is going to go to the tax agency. And that happens every year for 18 years. So then how much do I have at the end? <clears throat> Anyone do it in their head? All right, somebody calculate that. Meanwhile, let's look at a consumption tax. 
How much? 714. About. So you earned $1,000 today. You invested it for 18 years. <clears throat> and then 18 years and your 18th birthday, you know, you withdraw from the bank account after you paid all your taxes. You're going to have $714 that you can consume 18 years from now. Okay, so you can buy an iPhone 6. <laughs> all right, now. Consumption tax, you earn $1,000 in the day you're born, you know, I don't know what you did, but you're a very productive child. So what happens to that amount under a consumption tax? And here we're going to use a consumption rate of 100% because basically 100% consumption tax is equivalent to a 50% income tax in any given period. They're taking half of what you have. Think about it long enough. All right, so <clears throat> you're born, you earned $1,000, you sold your baby pictures, People Magazine. Uh, what happens when you want to make an investment under a consumption tax, when you want to save it? What happens to the $1,000? Are you consuming it? Are you purchasing anything? So you don't pay any taxes up front. You invest the full $1,000. All right? <clears throat> now, every year you're earning interest on it. Do you pay taxes on that? As long as you don't consume, it's only on based on consumption. So if you save, you just get. 4% uh, return. Do that for 18 years, how much do you have at the end? Remember we said $2,000. All right, so now on your 18th birthday, you get a $2,000 withdrawal. Now, if you want to buy something, what's the most you can buy with $2,000 if there's 100% consumption tax? You can buy $1,000 worth of consumption, and you pay $1,000 in consumption taxes. So basically, it turns out to be times 0.5. So now, if you save $1,000 under this system, 18 years from now, you have $1,000 to consume. So you, now you can buy iPhone X. So <clears throat> the same amount of earnings leads to a higher level of consumption in the future under consumption tax and under income tax. So this works out for any type of savings. So in general, consumption tax gives you a bigger incentive to save than an in income tax. And savings could be valuable to the economy because that's more capital that companies can use in the meantime to grow. And so income taxes by maybe discouraging savings could be affecting the growth rate, <clears throat> potentially. All right, so <clears throat> in terms of regressivity, as I said, as a share of income, all right, the share of income that's spent on consumption in any given year is decreasing. And here we have it for a number of different income groups splitting out the top group into fine group, uh, fine, more finely partitioned sets. So some people are spending more than their income and consumption. That's either because they have, they're borrowing, they're going into debt, or they have transfers, for example, from the government, something like that. <clears throat> All right, so we don't have, a, what we have in the US are sales taxes. <clears throat> They're generally at the state level. All but five states have some sort of sales tax. Um, sometimes we exempt items in the, in the interest of fairness. Come back to this idea. Um, and there are different variants. We have a use tax. So um, 
Basically, that's a tax on, for example, if you buy a good um, in another state through Amazon, but you consume it in Illinois, you bought it from California, you're supposed to pay taxes on that in Illinois because you're essentially consuming it in Illinois. There are luxury taxes which focus on items that higher income people purchase. <clears throat> Excise taxes are just a different type of sales tax for specific goods like gas taxes, for example. Um, alcohol taxes are a type of excise tax. They also can be thought of as a sin tax because we're trying to discourage some type of, at least we argue we may be trying to discourage certain types of behavior like cigarettes, smoking. And then we have Pagovian taxes, which are taxes that are also meant to change what you do. Maybe Reduce your use of carbon, for example. So a carbon tax would be an example of a Pagovian tax, but it's, it's also a sales tax, consumption tax. <clears throat> okay, a value-added tax uh, works differently. It's widely used it's across developed countries, other types of countries. Um, <clears throat> basically, what a value-added tax does is it charges taxes at each stage of production on the value-added <clears throat> Um, by a firm, um, and it taxes everything, <clears throat> or you can deduct all your expenses at that stage of production except your labor expenses. Um, so, there's an, to give you an example, let's say I had the, a loaf of bread, and I have a 10% vat, on the loaf of bread, <clears throat> okay, so let's say we have a farmer that just uses their labor <clears throat> and then they grow some wheat and they sell the wheat for 10 cents. Okay, so you had a farmer, they make some wheat, they sell it. 10 cents so they their only input was their labor so they don't deduct any of their costs and their out their value added to that wheat was 10 cents because they took something and then now they converted it into 10 cents all right so this is their value added so the vat paid by the farmer is going to be one cent then we have the miller. I didn't know this is what a miller did until this example. So, does anyone know what a miller does? They grind flour, um, and then they grind the wheat, and they make it into flour. All right, so the miller is going to buy the wheat for 10 cents. All right. They're going to sell it for 40 cents. Okay, so their value added was 30 cents. All right, and so then they pay 3 cents in VAT. You have a baker, take the flour, make it into bread. All right, and they're going to sell it for 80 cents. Okay. They bought it for, they bought the flour for 40 cents. Their value added is 40 cents. They pay 4 cents in value added. And then you have the final stage, you have the grocer. They sell the bread for a dollar. They bought it for 80 cents. Value added is 20 cents. They pay 2 cents. So then throughout the chain, the tax, the government collects 10 cents in value added taxes from a dollar, a product that costs a dollar. Okay? Now it may seem like this is a more complicated way to collect taxes than to just have a sales tax. But in fact, what it does is at each stage, if the flour 
if the miller wants to deduct 10 cents, um, they need proof that they paid 10 cents to the farmer. So they want to get a receipt. They want to report it to the government. And now the government knows that the miller sold something for 10 cents. So now the, the miller is on the hook for one cent. So there's basically additional enforcement that is built, baked in, no pun intended, there's a additional enforcement that is baked into a VAT. All right, so <clears throat> we don't have the VAT in the US. <clears throat> Here's a quote from Larry Summers. He says that liberals think it's regressive because it's a consumption tax, and conservatives think it's a money machine. The reason why is because the VAT is uh, basically uh, included in to the final price that people pay. So people just see prices of goods, they just pay goods, they don't have any taxes on their, their receipt, and it may allow politicians to raise taxes more than they otherwise would have. <clears throat> so they think it's a way to make the economy grow, or the government grow as a share of the economy. So Larry Summers says, if they just reverse their positions, then maybe the VAT would happen. So if they just believed if, that the other person's belief was true. That's like a joke. It's a tax joke. All right, so you can see um, what the level of VATs are around uh, the world. <clears throat> and in many of these countries, they have things like universal health care and things like that. And they have... A lot of their health care is being spent through the government as opposed to private entities, and the way they fund that is through VATs, value-added taxes. So in Chicago, I complain about more than 10% sales tax on a good, but you're effectively paying 25% in uh, Hungary and Iceland, for example. So, All right, so... Um, I'm going to just, for the final couple of slides, I'm going to talk a little bit more about some empirical, um, other empirical results, um, more recent, some more recent than others, but some of the, all of these are going to be kind of related to sales taxes and uh, the incidence of a sales tax. So, um, One thing that we do when we uh, study sales taxes is we model how people's demand might respond to someone raising or lowering a tax. And that will affect who actually bears the burden of a tax. So if you're selling a good and you know that your consumer has to have it no matter what, and now a value added tax is increased, you might be able to raise the final selling price of the good without losing too much of your demand. Alternatively, if your good has a very good substitute that people are more than happy to switch to and if you try to raise the price at all, then you may not raise the price at all and then this additional value added tax would just eat into your profits as a, as a, as a firm that's selling the good. All right, so um, ultimately who bears the burden of a tax will depend on whether you have very elastic demand or inelastic demand. Inelastic being the type that is going to buy it no matter what. Um, so one of the assumptions we typically make in our standard economics models is that your demand for a good at a certain price with a given tax is just going to be a function of the total after-tax price. All you really care about is how much is coming out of your pocket for the good. You don't care whether some of it is a tax or some of it is just the price that they're charging or what's the difference. You just want to pay as little as possible for the good. Um, and so you just care about uh, the after-tax price. All right, so then the question is, what happens when the tax changes versus when the price changes for some reason? Does demand behave the same way? And if this is true, if this assumption is true, then what we, we have this thing called the elasticity of demand. Um, our classical, neoclassical model assumes that you behave the same way. You have the same elasticity, same sensitivity to an increase in what, the, what you have to ultimately pay after taxes for the good. So in this paper, Raj Chetty, Adam Looney, and Corey Croft, they look at whether they can empirically test this assumption or not. 
All right, and so they use two different empirical methods. They're going to use a field experiment, and then they're going to use some observational data where they have variation in how salient a price is. Okay, so this paper, they look at tax salience. Um, basically, how much do people pay attention to the taxes that they have to pay? All right, so their first study, what they do is they go to uh, a grocery store, and they manipulate the labels for the goods. All right, so normally at this grocery store, the sales taxes are not included on the label on the shelf. There's just a regular price. All right, so their idea, the assumption that we make, economists typically make, is that you're calculating the total price because that's what matters for your budget. So you say, all right, this thing costs $5.79. Do, 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 do. I can do taxes in my head. It's actually $6.22. That's what we assume when we do our empirical studies. So if that was the case, then they want to know what's the effect of adding this additional information right there for you. If you're already calculating that when you're making your consumption decisions, then it shouldn't matter at all. So that would be the null hypothesis. So they took a certain set of goods and they added an additional information. Now you get this information ultimately when you check out. So when you go to the checkout, your receipt gets rung up, and then you can see the taxes right there. Okay, but the question is, when you're deciding what to purchase, is, that, is the tax being factored in at that point? All right, so they're going to use an experiment and then mix it with what I described before as a difference in difference. <clears throat> All right, that's looking at a control group and a treatment group before and after a treatment took place. All right, so the baseline is the, the sales, um, all right, the quantity of goods sold in a certain category of goods in the weeks before the experiment took place. So they just had data from this firm, this grocery store. And so they had the control categories, how much were being sell, sold. They basically had like items in a certain aisle and in a bunch of stores. Okay, and then they had treatments categories where they changed the label. Okay, and so before, there wasn't much of a difference. There was a slight difference in how much was being sold. It's actually, it's actually significant. That's fine. We just want to, the assumption that we're making is that if we didn't do this experiment, that difference in sales would basically kind of be constant. <clears throat> All right, so that's the assumption that you need to make. Okay, now they ran the experiment. These are like later weeks in time. So this is in the earlier in time, later in time. Okay, and what they did was they looked at the relative quantity of goods sold in these two categories again. Now, the control category had the same price tag. The treated categories had the additional tax information. So what you can see is the difference between them now grows and becomes more negative. So the demand for the categories of goods that had extra information about taxes went down relative to the demand for the control group. All right, now, you can take the difference and see that these, this quantity grew by 0.84, which means that people were buying more of these goods over time, and people were buying less of these goods over time. So if you take the difference in the differences, you get the effect of the treatment. It's subtracting what generally happens over time and just focusing on what's the effect of this different label. <clears throat> now, what could be a problem with this type of design? Trends. Was it? Violation of parallel trends. Say that. Violation Lab. of parallel trends or something. Parallel trends. Right. right. So parallel trends, that's the assumption that if we didn't do this experiment, demand for these goods would grow as well. Now, what if this was the beginning of the summer and these goods were, you know, wool caps and these goods were, you know, swimming trunks? You might, have different you might have different trends in demand, even though you, know, you randomly chose some goods. So if you do that, that's going to uh, basically bias your estimate of the effect of showing people the taxes. So luckily, they thought about that, and they said, OK, we can use the same goods, 
Same exact categories, but go to set of stores where we don't do the experiment. Okay, and then at these stores, what they looked at was what was the trend in quantities for these two categories where we didn't do anything. And here, the patterns were very similar. Okay, and so the difference in difference in these stores is actually very close to zero. It's not statistically significant. So this is what we would call a placebo test because we, don't, we didn't do any experiment in these stores, so we don't necessarily expect to find any effect if our assumption is that these goods were basically being bought in the same rate over time. So you can also do what's called a difference in difference of differences. A difference in differences in differences or something like that. So you can take, if this is a, any of the bias that will be happening will be picked up here, you can subtract it from here. Okay, this tells you how swimming trucks, trunks compare to knitted hats in general. And this is now that we did an experiment. So there's not much of a difference. So you, luckily, you're on firmer ground if you get a zero here, which they basically got. But just to be sure, you can subtract these two things and get the DDD estimate. All right? So this basically violated the null hypothesis that people take the full tax into account when they're buying the good. Um, another problem could be, well, maybe it's just a weird price tag. And when you see a weird price tag, you just don't buy it because you don't know what's going on. So then they had to go into the real world where they have a similar experiment. So basically what they looked at um, was beer consumption across different states. Beer is taxed in two different ways. It's taxed as an excise tax, and it's also you have to pay sales tax on the beer. Now, the excise tax is not paid by the customer. So the price you see on the shelf includes the excise tax. So it's not salient. Or, yeah, sorry. The price, the excise tax is actually included in the price, so it is salient. Because if it goes up, when you go to the shelf, you see a higher price. So this is... As the excise tax increases across states, the demand decreases at a certain rate for beer. This is a salient tax because it shows up as soon as you see the product on the shelf. Now, sales taxes, on the other hand, they only get realized when you go to the register and they calculate your sales tax for you. So it's less salient. And as you can see, when sales taxes increase, you don't get as much of an increase. So this result kind of put a damper on the neoclassical model where everyone fully, is fully aware of all the taxes that they're paying on their goods. And it raises question of what happens when the taxes aren't salient. All right, so the, I did talk about, so I know we're going to take a break after an hour and a half, so I'm just going to do a couple more slides and we can uh, break. Um, so. I talked about Pigouvian taxes. These are taxes on behaviors that we'd either like you to do more than you're doing or less than you're doing. Uh, so when you're doing too much of a thing and it's bad for other people, we say that there's a negative externality. Okay, when you're doing something, you're doing too little of a thing and it's good for other people, it's a positive externality. So I have, I'm going on a trip, so I had to get a, a immunization at Walgreens. It was very stressful in Walgreens yesterday. People were waiting in line. They were understaffed. There was no disrespect at Walgreens, but they had, I don't know, someone didn't show up to work, and it was, a, it was a mess. So, but my immunization probably helps other people because I don't end up contracting something that I might be able to share with other people. So you might want to subsidize vaccinations and immunizations for that reason. We also want to tax carbon emissions because they have bad effects on other people. Uh, noise pollution is another type of externality that you could be enjoying music, but it can affect other people. I mentioned vaccinations. My favorite is research. It has a personal value to me, but it's also valuable to all you guys, the knowledge that I produce. So that should be subsidized too. So I'm in favor of that policy. Um, <clears throat> All right, so here's an example of a syntax that you see floating around now more and more. 
So Tatiana Hamanoff did a study in DC. She wanted to know whether this is related to the same basically testing or uh, stress testing or, you know, seeing how robust the neoclassical model is. So in that previous example, we said if you're not paying attention to the tax, it could result in different behavior. What she tested in this case was what happens when you subsidize something versus taxing something. In particular, if I want you to do something, one way to do it is to tax you from not doing it. So I can say, if you don't have insurance, I'm going to basically charge you a penalty. Another thing I could do is subsidize you in order to encourage you to do it. So I can say, if you buy insurance, I give you a discount. In some sense, in the standard model, those are equivalent. Right? They're just both changing the, the, the relative cost of doing the activity. All right? So she looked at what happens when you subsidize or tax to encourage behavior. And in behavior economics, we have this model of loss aversion that could break down the symmetry between a tax and a subsidy. So in Washington, D.C., and, and in Maryland, they have a five-cent tax for plastic bag use. Okay? Um, and then, basically, she looked at different stores uh, to see what the effect of this five-cent tax would be on bag, plastic bag use. And then there were a set of stores that offered a $5 bonus for bringing a reusable bag, which is equivalent, um, equivalent to taxing you for buying a plastic bag or using a plastic bag. So this is a subsidy that encourages the same type of behavior, substituting for plastic to reusable. All right, so what she did was she exited, she did surveys of shoppers coming in and out of the store before and after the policy changed. So for those of you that are going and doing your own research, this is like a heroic job that she did. She just walked around to all the supermarkets, collected the data herself. So where there's a will, there's a job market paper. All right, so <laughs> here is the use of bags by location, time, and period. All right, so in Arlington County, Virginia, so if you've never been to D.C., there's like three different states right on each other and a poorly maintained metro system. So she probably had to walk from each state. So here's Arlington County. They had no taxes before or after, okay? And in proportion, using a disposable bag is about the same. All right, in Montgomery County, in the post period, there was a tax. You see the consumption of plastic, of Disposable bags went down. DC, they always had the tax before and after, and you don't see much of a change in disposable bags. So this is the effect of the tax. <clears throat> now, here, um, yeah, so I think this is just a compliment. So these are these people using reusable bags. So there's an effect. This tax does discourage people from using plastic bags. Everybody see that? All right, now, what she did now is she looked at the stores that offered um, incentives for you to use a reusable bag. The same magnitude, five cents, if you bring in your own reusable bag. So you save five cents by not using a plastic bag. <clears throat> All right, so here are stores um, in Virginia. So this is Maryland before, this is Maryland, uh, Virginia before and Virginia after. There's no incentives here. They have similar uses of disposable bags. Here are the Maryland stores that offered a bonus. And the key thing here is that if you look within the same state, so this is Maryland, whether or not you offer a bonus, you have the same level of disposable bag usage. So the, the subsidy doesn't seem to be kicking in as much as the tax. These are places with only a tax. All right, so DC after, DC before, and Maryland after. So Maryland after versus Maryland before. You see much lower usage, so that's the tax effect. Here are stores that have the tax and the bonus. You might expect the bonus would add an extra you know, emphasis or an extra incentive to reduce disposable usage, but you don't see much of a difference. So DC uh, post. DC before, DC before, DC post. The ordering is weird, but the levels are really not responding 
to the subsidy. So the tax causes this big difference in height. The bonus doesn't do much <clears throat> within different tax regimes. All right? Um, so, you know, her, her, uh, her conclusion was that the taxes were much more effective in changing people's behavior than a subsidy of the same amount. Question. Did you, was she looking at a specific population type? Like people at one level socioeconomics uh, level, or was she just looking, she didn't actually take her factor that in? I don't recall. I have to look back at the paper. She did a survey, but it prob they probably kept the survey pretty quick because it was people coming out of the you know, supermarket and just taking a quick uh, sur survey. But there's different incomes across these different areas, so that's one thing you could use. You know, another question could be is like, uh, there, there are different types of stores that offer the bonus. So, you know, that's another difference between these two. But it's, I guess, a little reassuring that the levels are the same, you know, between bonus and non-bonus stores. But that is not uh, using as much nice variation as the before and after with the tax. The bonus is identified from just looking at two different types of stores. One is very green oriented and one isn't. So, uh, you know, that is a little more tentative than using a difference in difference. But um, I'd have to look back at the paper to see if she had other demographics. Um, all right, so let me just skip this because we don't have a lot of time. I will point this out. Chicago did have a case study. Here's a case study. Chicago did have a plastic bag tax, seven cents per bag. There was a huge drop in bags, okay, 42% drop. The city budget was passed assuming that they were going to get a lot of revenue from the plastic bag tax. They thought they were going to get $9 million, they only got $1 million. All right, so <clears throat> um, here's a headline that came out of it. The huge drop in bag use due to the bag tax could cost the city millions. Study finds. <laughs> now, this was, I saw this and I salivated. I was like, I have to tweet this. This is so funny. Uh, because the goal of the Pagovian tax was supposed to be to reduce consumption of plastic bags. So they can't have it both ways. Um, when you hear people motivating Pagovian taxes based on the revenue that they're going to generate, the revenue is not the point of a Pagovian tax. Um, all right, let me just stop here for now so we can go to the break because I ate into the break. Hey, there's a question. Yes? Um, would it, that doesn't factor into the, the fact that costs would be less in terms of waste management because perhaps they were spending a lot of money on, like, cost. cost. For in terms firm? of waste management, because perhaps the city was spending a lot of money on getting rid of these plastic bags because they're yeah. extremely problematic. Now that they've reduced it, there's an effective gain. Yeah, so that wasn't, uh, that wasn't um, incorporated. And, you know, also, whatever they substituted to is also has a cost, but presumably it costs less because why would we try to shift you to reusable bags that they cost this month. But you're right that they missed that. They missed a lot of things. Um, all right, so we're going to take a break. So this part is going to get more theoretical, technical. But I'm not going to spend as much time deriving the results, but I'll be describing more theoretical results. In the third part, I'll talk about research and empirical research and, you know, hopefully that will also, that'll involve describing different types of empirical methods, but also, <clears throat> you know, be more applied. So if you do public finance, you have to mix in theory with the empirics. You just, it makes, uh, it makes, it makes our research better. So I'm going to take you through a little bit more theoretical stuff. All right, so we talked about taxes in general. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the economics of taxation, how they affect the economy. Um, all right, so they affect the economy in a lot of different ways. So they may reduce the rewards to doing things, taxes. So at the margin, it makes it a little less rewarding to work, save, or maybe invest because we're taking a cut out of it. Um, <clears throat> we also might cause people to do things differently than they might normally do. So you might shift to a place of lower tax, that tax avoidance. Um, 
And so in order to uh, also to comply with taxes or to evade them, that takes time and effort. And so there's resources that we devote to just understanding the tax policy, for example. And so that might be a necessary evil or a burden or unnecessary burden, depending on how you look at it. And then we're also redistributing across different types of individuals. Um, sometimes rich to poor, sometimes poor to rich, one group regionally to another group, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about some of the costs, some of the benefits. So one cost, so uh, the, the, one of the standard costs that we think about is that in order to raise a dollar of tax revenue, it usually costs the economy more than a dollar. All right, this is what we call, under various names, the marginal cost of public funds also known as dead weight loss, also known as excess burden. So it has a ton of, uh, um, what do you call them? Uh, your ally, uh, aliases, sorry. Okay, so for a dollar in tax revenue, we sometimes estimate it may cost us as much as 30 additional cents in lost uh, resources in order to collect that dollar, all right? so. Um, how do we measure this? Uh, so I'm going to show you a standard approach, which is to look at um, a simple market and show how a tax will cause there to be, in addition to the money that the government collects, some, some dead weight loss. So let's consider that you're buying iPhone apps, okay, through the App Store. Um, and then let's say that we're going to levy what's called an ad valorem tax of T on the apps. So an ad valorem tax is a proportional tax. So like a 10% tax would be an ad valorem tax. That's different than a unit or a specific tax, which would be a flat amount per unit. So like $1 per every app that you buy. So this is going to be an ad valorem tax, proportional to how much you spend. So let's start with the market for apps. Prior to the tax, OK, this is our demand curve. And this is our simple supply curve. And we have equilibrium here, quantity, and the price of an app. Okay, we want to levy a proportional tax. <clears throat> okay, so now um, we're going to have the firm, um, they're going to have to, in addition to the price that is charged, an additional amount of T times P in tax revenue has to be delivered to the government. Okay, so we can say that now um, we're going to have this, Apple pay the tax, and so they're going to potentially raise the price that they're going to charge for this tax. Okay, and as you raise the price, you're going to lose some people who no longer want to purchase apps. They want to do something else. All right, so we call this area under the demand curve and above the price that's paid. I'm going to call it consumer surplus. Previously, this whole triangle was a surplus to the, to the consumers. This is how much they value each app that they buy, and this is how much they paid. So the difference is uh, net value to them. They're basically getting a deal. But now the price is higher. There's less people, and they we're cutting into their surplus. Okay, so we lost this whole trapezoid in surplus. Okay, so that is one way to think about one loss. The consumers on net are buying less, and they're getting less per item that they purchase. Now, some of that we recoup, this rectangle is going to be tax revenue. Okay, so for the remaining items that are sold, this amount goes to the firm, all right? And then this additional rectangle here goes to the government. So we, that consumer surplus is not completely lost. Some of it is transferred to the government. And then we have the excess burden. So you have this triangle here. That is just gone from this market. It's no longer being produced, sold, consumed. Um, and the government is not even benefiting from it. So in a, to raise this rectangle, we, had to loot, we also had to basically uh, sacrifice this triangle or this deadweight loss triangle, all right? And so you said, I thought it was going to get technical, but this is just a triangle. <laughs> but what's the area of a triangle? One half base times height. So it's speeding up. Don't worry. <laughs> one day you'll look back at this slide and be like, oh, the days when we just had to do one half base times height. All right, so the area is one half base times height. So in this picture, 
this, we want to know how much of this is, how much of, what is this loss here? All right, the base is the change in the quantity, and the height is the change in the price. All right, so we get one half times the change in the quantity times the change in the price. That's the area of that triangle. Let's calculate the change in the price. We can do that easily. We just look at the after tax price minus the original price. Okay? You do a little math and you get T times P. All right? That is the height of the triangle. So we, we got that very easily. Now we need to know by how much did the quantity reduce. All we know is what the tax is. We don't know anything else. So we need to know a little bit more about consumers. So I'm going to call eta uh, the elasticity of demand. Okay, and I'm putting compensated in parentheses, but you, you can ignore that for now. All right, it's defined as the percent change, so delta Q over Q, the percent change in demand given a 1% change in price. So delta P over P kind of in the denominator. So this is a definition of the elasticity. All right, now I'm trying to see for a given change in price, how much does quantity change? If this holds, I can rearrange the terms and I can relate the change in quantity to any given change in price. Okay, I just need to know the base, uh, basically the, in the denominator of that price per unit, multiply by the, so I have the elasticity divided by the price per unit times the change in price to get the change in quantity. All right, so we already know the change in price, T times P. So we can plug that in, and then actually, magically, the P's cancel out. We get eta times Q times T. All right? So that's delta Q. All right, now we have the base. So now we can get the uh, area. It's going to be one-half times the change in price from change in quantity. We did that change in price. We got the change in quantity. We collect terms, and we get one-half times eta, P times Q, and then T squared. All right, so this is known as what's called a Harburger Triangle, named after Harburger, who is uh, an economist, actually a Chicago, University of Chicago economist. All right, <clears throat> and this is the classic formula that tells you how much in excess burden or deadweight loss there will be when you levy a tax. All right, and this, just this analytical result gives us some features of a tax. What makes a tax more or less burdensome or to have more or less excess burden? All right, so there's the sensitivity of demand. So the more elastic that demand is, the more the deadweight loss will be. Okay, so that means more people are going to reduce their consumption of the good if I try to tax it. And so that's going to be what we call a leaky barrel. If people are going to flee this market, the more I tax it, then to raise some revenue, I'm going to lose a lot in uh, economic activity. So that is costly. Um, the size of the market matters. So this is total expenditures before I entered this market. So the bigger the market, the bigger the, um, the bigger the excess burden. And then finally, there's this, there's a twist here. It's not, the loss isn't proportional to T, it's proportional to T squared. Okay, so that is actually going to guide our decisions of how to tax goods, knowing that uh, and again, this is a market that didn't have any taxes to begin with. It's very different if there's already a tax in place. The, actually, the burden is bigger. But without any b tax to begin with, the initial burden is proportional to T squared, not T. So it's not linear. Okay, so what that means is that it's growing co in a convex way. All right, so if I double the tax, I more than double the excess burden. It's not linear. So... The upshot then is that I, if I have to tax two different goods um, in two different markets and they're not related, it's better to, to get half of the revenue from each place than to target all the revenue in one place because loading the taxes on one market is going to cause a quadratic growth in uh, burden, not a linear growth. So it's not that I can just do uh, three quarters here and a quarter there. I want to kind of balance across markets, and I'll be more precise about how we balance across the markets in a second. But that is where you get this notion that you want to have a broad base for your tax revenue. You want to tax more goods instead of focusing on just one good. So 
the reason why I wrote this, this formula is because it, it then has some practical um, use for us if we're trying to approximately think about what the additional economic cost of a tax is going to be. So here's an example. Let's say I'm going to have a 10% tax on iPhone apps, and I know this about the market. Let's say I know that, oh, they spent $213 million on apps. The tax rate is 10%. And let's just say that there is an elasticity of one, that we happen to know this from some other nice researcher that shared their data with us. Just with that information, I can calculate the excess burden using this formula. So I plug in for ADA, total revenue, and then I take the square of the tax. This tells me that a 10% tax on this market is going to have associated with it $1 million in excess burden that won't be recouped by the government, it won't go to consumers or producers. It will be uh, just um, an additional cost of raising revenue in this market. All right, so um, we're going to see that the goal in many of these public finance uh, theoretical treatments is to derive formula that have um, practical empirical content to them. Okay, so that's one of the nice things about the theory is that we can try as best we can to take it to the data. All right, now, the benefit of the taxes is that we're going to raise revenue. So it's always good for the government, if they have goals and things that they need to do to raise revenue. One result that we have is that um, <clears throat> it's actually not true that you can just continue to raise taxes and always increase your revenue. We have something called the Laffer Curve, all right? And basically, this is a very simple idea, <clears throat> but it can be used in a lot of different ways, sometimes misused and abused. So um, let's think about which tax rates do I charge that are guaranteed to generate zero revenue? This is the easiest way to raise no revenue. A tax of 0%. All right? So All right, so if I have my revenue and my tax rate, if I charge 0, very likely to get 0%. Uh, 0 in tax revenue, OK? Um, now, what's the other tax rate that is likely to generate zero revenue? 100%. If, if you go to work and I'm going to take all of your wages, you might as well not go to work, okay? So we know that the tax rate has, the, the revenue has to pass through zero at these two amounts. It's going to be positive at some point, all right? And because it's positive and assuming that it's continuous, it has to come back down to zero somehow, all right? So the Laffer rate, the Laffer curve says there's some maximum tax rate that would maximize tax revenue. There's no reason to raise taxes beyond this amount. You're going to continue to increase excess burden. You're actually going to lose revenue. So no matter what your preferences are, you should never charge more than the, the Laffer tax. And so when you hear someone say we're on the wrong side of the Laffer curve, they're claiming that we're, taxes are so high that if we reduce taxes, revenues would actually go up. That theoretically has to hold at some level of taxes. The question is at what level it is. If you want to reduce taxes, always argue you're on the wrong side of the Laffer curve. And if someone tells you we're on the wrong side of the Laffer curve, then you get to laugh at them. So, um, but there should be a ma tax uh, maximizing rate, and we're actually going to calculate it later on a later slide. To give you a preview, uh, Diamond and Saez look at the income tax um, elasticities that we have, and they, they calculate that the revenue maximizing rate is anywhere between 50 and 70 
6% in terms of top marginal tax rate. <clears throat> All right, so what else can taxes do? Um, can we use taxes to stimulate the economy? In particular, will tax cuts boost the economy? All right, so this has to do with macro theories about what causes business cycles. Okay, and so during the Great Recession, for example, there were tax cuts that, were tried to, that we tried to use to stimulate the economy and potentially trigger multipliers. All right, so um, in the 70s, this uh, notion was kind of abandoned. People just thought that empirically it wasn't consistent because it couldn't explain why we would have stagflation, which is um, periods of uh, economic slowdown and um, inflation. Okay, so that wasn't consistent with this model, this Keynesian model. So economists have basically abandoned that policy. <clears throat> but in the 2000s, we've returned to them, especially in the Great Recession, because we, you know, we had to try whatever we could. So the questions about should we have government spending or tax cuts? What kind of fiscal policy should we use? Um, if we're going to use government spending, then the value of the government spending matters. Okay, so there are a lot of issues that are involved, but one of the things we can do with taxes is try to control the business cycle. Um, now, whether a tax cut stimulates the economy depends a lot on whether people are forward-looking and whether they view it as a permanent tax cut or a temporary tax cut. All right, so if it's a temporary tax cut and you know that taxes are going to go up in the future, we have this thing called Ricardian equivalence, which says you shouldn't spend that money because they're going to try to get it back to you in the future. Save it. And that won't do much to uh, stimulate the economy. On the other hand, if it's permanent, then uh, you might be more likely to spend this money because your taxes are going to be low now and in the future you're in a new equilibrium. All right. Part of what happens depends on the, multi the marginal propensity to consume. So if I give you a tax cut, so for example, we gave tax cuts between $600 and $1,200 during prior recession in the U.S. The question is, how much of that will you spend? If you don't spend a lot of it, or if you use it to pay down debt, that's not going to necessarily stimulate the economy. Now, different models have different predictions for how you might spend that money. So $600 relative to your lifetime income is pretty low. And so if you have a permanent income model, you might not predict people spending that much because uh, they should smooth it out over the rest of their life. Now, in practice, we find violations of these predictions. Um, one example is the Alaska Permanent Fund. So this is a, a cash transfer that's paid to all Alaskan uh, residents annually. And there's a question of how much do they spend and how much should they spend. Um, and there's some research by Lorenz Kyung that finds actually there's a pretty sizable marginal propensity to consume 30%. Um, and actually what he finds is that contrary to what you might believe, the marginal propensity to consume all things equal is higher for richer people. Um, so uh, the reason is that uh, higher income people, uh, if they blow their entire $1,000 payment, the loss, the mistake of overspending that is not that dramatic. But if you're low income, you might want to think very carefully about how you use this payment. So that was what he deduced from the data. On the other hand, if, you're, uh, if you don't have a lot of liquid wealth, so if you are credit constrained and you can't borrow and you kind of really have a, what we call a high marginal utility consumption, those households are also more likely to consume. Um, and so that factors into whether something would be a good stimulus or not. Here's his estimate of date time zeros when you get a Alaska permanent dividend. And this is how much of it is spent um, after six months. So at least 30% of it is spent after six months, which is higher than you would predict with a pure permanent income model, life cycle model. And then he broke it down by income quintile and he found the highest marginal propensities to consume were among the top income uh, quintile. Um, so even though these groups are more likely to be credit constrained, the, factor, the fact that this is a small amount of money and it's you can kind of be careless with it, 
dominates and leads to higher marginal propensities consumed for the richest people in Alaska. All right, now another thing that a stimulus can do is just accelerate or retime your, your spending. So it doesn't mean that you're gonna do new spending, but you're just gonna do spending more now than you would maybe down the road. Okay, so an example would be uh, cash for clunkers, which try to accelerate when you would buy a car during a recession to try to stimulate the economy. Or uh, home mortgage subsidies or in incentives. Um, now, the problem with accelerating consumption is that if it comes, if you have an acceleration and an increase now, you also have to have a decrease in the future. So if you have too much of a ramp up, you could have actually a return, coming back down to earth could actually trigger um, some other type of recessionary uh, event. All right, so here's a study by me and Sufi that looked at cash for clunkers, um, and basically... They looked at regions that had a lot of clunkers versus regions that didn't have a lot of clunkers. Okay, and they looked at average purchases of cars. If you had a clunker, you got an incentive to trade it in and get an, uh, a newer car. And so in the regions with a lot of clunkers, you saw an increase in purchases in the short run. That's the ramping up. But you also saw less purchases happening over the next couple of months. And so these things kind of cancel out. And so the net difference was an increase in the beginning, but eventually the, the two groups were not that different after um, maybe a year or so. Okay, so the stimulus didn't have a permanent effect. It just had a retiming effect. All right, another thing that tax, the tax schedule does is if it's progressive, it also acts as an uh, automatic stabilizer. So that's a, another type of stimulus that um, actually happens automatically. So the most effective kind of stimulus potentially is this automatic stabilizer. When the economy is doing bad and your income goes down, you get more of an e EITC, for example. You start to get, you qualify for SNAP, food subsidies, or if you get unemployed, unemployment insurance is another type of automatic stabilizer. So these kick in exactly when you need it. They kick in very, um, in a very timely fashion. Some more than others, the EITC has some delay when you actually see the money. Um, and so a progressive tax system basically has built into it this insurance so that when the economy is doing bad, your tax liability goes down by more than your income does if it's a progressive system. And that can act as a stabilizer. All right, so um, we're going to talk more about how do you compare these costs and benefits. Uh, we're going to look at some specific uh, uh, examples, so I'll just continue on. Um, so we'll come back to the question of what, how do you weigh these costs and benefits against each other. Now, another question is, can taxes affect growth? Um, an argument you hear for keeping taxes at a low amount is that, or a low level, is that they they discourage economic activity, and they hamper the ability for the economy, economy to grow as fast as it could. Now, what, the effect of taxes on growth are very hard to pin down. And the problem is that relative to some of the studies I've shown you that have either a field experiment or a nice research design, we don't have the nice type of experiment with taxes and growth. Basically, we have totally different countries that have different tax rates, for example. And so trying to pin down how taxes affect those economies is a tall order because there's so many other things happening at the same time across these different countries. When a country passes a tax cut, like in the US, we passed a tax cut in December. There are a lot of other things going on right now in the US, let's just say that. So um, you can't tell necessarily what the effects are of a tax cut um, with a lot of precision, given the type of data we have. But there are some things we can at least posit or um, present. So one is that uh, cutting taxes or having high taxes are not sufficient to slow down an economy. So some of the highest marginal tax rates we have ever had were in the 50s and the 60s, 90% marginal tax rates. But those are also time where there was very um, 
rapid growth in the economy in the U.S. Okay? Now, the other question is, are we on the wrong side of the Laffer curve? And as far as we can tell, the answer is going to be no. Tax cuts are generally not going to pay for themselves. Even if a tax cut causes the economy to grow, it's not causing it to grow enough to pay more than compensate for the tax cut. Most public finance economists generally think that that is not something that you can bank on. A lot of politicians will use this as a selling point when they try to calculate the effects of their tax cuts on the economy. Now, here we actually have some nicer evidence. Uh, anybody from Kansas? No, okay. Um, at the expense of Kansas, we have a really nice experiment. So what Kansas did, um, they cut their, uh, their corporate tax um, tremendously, and they did that in an effort to boost the economy. And this gave us a chance to see whether they were on the wrong side of the Laffer curve. Okay, and what we found, all right, they had, uh, they basically cut their taxes on pass-through income, which is a type of income that you get from um, owning certain types of corporations. All right, so they had three tax brackets, 3.5%, 6.25%, 6.45%. They cut it to just a bracket with 3% and 4.9%. Okay, this caused massive reductions in the tax liability for those firms. Maybe that made the firms do more business, but it by no means does it look like that caused their revenue to actually increase. And this is a pretty nice time series. You can see that these states, similar types of states, have a very similar business cycle in terms of their tax revenue. And right when Kansas decided to cut the taxes, you can see what happened to the revenue. So this notion that we're on the wrong side of the Laffer curve does not appear to be empirically grounded. All right, now, other things that taxes can affect, your labor supply or your amount of savings. So a lot of the studies have tried to look at what are the effects of income taxes on labor supply. They typically find for prime age workers that there's not a uh, huge response. Yes? Uh, do we have like any data on the number of jobs that were created? Like were there more jobs out there for people during that time? At the um, I think that would be possible to get. I've only, I only have seen from this study this uh, revenue effect. Um, Alright, so what we find is that the, the main sort of whatever breadwinner in a household is less likely to respond to taxes during their, their, their prime aged years. However, we do see secondary earners seem to be more sensitive to tax, uh, marginal tax rates. Um, so that would be the earner that may enter or exit the labor force. Potentially, they are substituting child, home child care and home production for going into the labor force. They tend to be more sensitive. Historically, that has, in the U.S., traditionally been women, but that's not necessarily always the case, or increasingly, that's less of the case in terms of the ranking of earnings. Although, if you ask people to report their earnings, there's all this pressure for women to report at or below their husband's earnings, even when they earn more. So that, it's hard to know who's earning more in, in the household, given the social norms. But, typically, we find that secondary earners tend to face high marginal tax rates, especially when their spouse is a high income earner. And they, that is where we might see some sensitivity in labor supply. Now, there's been a debate, a long-standing debate, on whether if you subsidize people's savings, whether that causes them to save more. We talked about how income taxes basically uh, depress the incentive to save. So we have, um, rather than, I guess, converting to a consumption tax, We've tried to patch back on top of that an incentive to save. So what we do is subsidize your savings in retirement. Remember, I told you if you learn anything, put your money in um, an IRA or 401k, invest it in an index, and reap the tax subsidies. But 
The question is, is that getting more people to save or is that just getting people who were already saving to shift their money into a tax, what we call a tax preferred vehicle? So basically, we want to we want to uh, encourage more saving because that can help economic growth. But are we just giving money to what we call inframarginal savers who had the money somewhere else? Now they're just going to put it into their 401k. It's going to grow faster because they're not paying taxes on it. So some of the best evidence on this was actually evidence from um, Denmark. The reason why is because we have really nice data on people's uh, basically their wealth and their retirement savings across different forms of savings. Um, and so Chetty Freeman, Leith Peterson, Nielsen, and Olson have a very convincing study that shows that these subsidies are probably not really encouraging new savings. So I can tell the story in two pictures. What they look at is what happens when um, basically over time, there was a change in the subsidy for putting your, um, your savings into a tax preferred uh, account for people above the top tax rate. So people in the top tax bracket. And what you see is that when the subsidy decreased, the amount of savings in those account accounts did decrease and it looks to be convincingly because the policy was passed. So you might conclude subsidies do work. When you cut the subsidies, people save less. But because they have data on the whole portfolio, they also looked at their savings in the non-retirement accounts. And at the same time, that increased almost by the same amount. So rather than a subsidy causing people maybe to save more or less, it seemed to be causing them to put their money in one account versus another. So for the economy, there's not much of an effect. For every dollar of government expenditure, they increase savings by one cent on net. So that's a very expensive subsidy. It's very lucrative for these people who are saving in the pre-period, uh, but it didn't really affect the economy as much as you would previously thought. All right, so now we've talked about the costs and the benefits. Now we're going to do a little bit and thinking about like the principles behind doing, uh, deriving how we should optimally set these taxes, given that there are some benefits and there's some costs. Um, and here we're going to get a little more technical. All right, so <clears throat> as I said, some of the first order costs and benefits are going to be what we can do with the revenue that we raise from a good. We want to trade that off against the deadweight loss that we create. So the first thing we're going to look at is what's called the Ramsey rule. This is a rule for setting taxes on commodities, so like sales taxes or taxes on goods. All right, we want to minimize the day weight loss while still reaching a certain required amount of revenue. That's how we're going to set up the problem. And we want to know as a tax planner, as a social planner, how would you set taxes? It's actually going to have a very simple result. You can make the model much more complicated but you get the same basic results, all right? So let's say there are N different goods across different markets, like those triangles that we drew. And we're just going to say that there's deadweight loss in each market as a function of the tax. So we had a calculation for deadweight loss. And so we know that as we raise the tax, the deadweight loss is going to increase. At the same time, there's a value because from each market, we're going to get some revenue at least locally as we increase the tax, okay? And we need that revenue to add up to some minimum revenue requirement that we need for something. In this model, that revenue is, we're going to abstract from what it's used for. It's just required to basically pay for basic government functioning, all right? So we can set up this problem using calculus. We can set up a Lagrangian. All right, so what we do with Lagrangian? We want to minimize this sum here, and we want to take into account that we have to satisfy the revenue constraint. All right, so those of you familiar with Lagrangians, this is a tool to optimize. And the thing that we're they're choosing, we're choosing a tax rate for each market. 
So every time we change the tax rate, that can affect the market. All right, so in order to solve this, basically we just take a derivative with respect to each tax. And we set it equal to zero, that would be what we call a first order condition. That tells us the condition under which we're at an optimum. All right, so if I do the derivative of this with respect to t, assuming that t only affects market, t1 only affects market one, then I'm gonna have the marginal change in deadweight loss plus lambda times the marginal, minus the marginal change of revenue equals zero. And when I rearrange terms, I get this ratio here. The ratio of the marginal deadweight loss to the revenue that I raise as I increase the tax slightly, it's gonna be set equal to this, this thing lambda. All right, now this lambda has an economic interpretation, but a key thing to notice is that it, is not, it doesn't have a subscript. It's the same across all the markets. So I want this to be, this ratio to be equalized across markets. And this is one way to think about what we call the Ramsey rule, but we're gonna unpack it and see what are the economic implications of the Ramsey rule. So if I know that for market I and for market J, this ratio is equal to the same thing, I can just plug them in and see, I need this ratio to be equal across markets, all of the markets, okay? And this intuitively makes sense. If this thing is out of whack, so if this ratio is higher over here than over here, then I'm not at an optimum. Okay, does anybody see why I'm not at the optimum? Okay, here's the reason why. All right, the marginal deadweight loss is higher in this market than it is in this market. So if I, let's say I take the same amount of, let's say I take more revenue from this market and less revenue from this market and take, but I have those be equal. So there's no change in the government revenue. I haven't raised any more revenue. But if I shift from this market the deadweight loss is going to go down by more than what the deadweight loss is going to go up in this market. So the total amount of deadweight loss in the economy has gone down without losing any revenue. So if these things aren't equal, I haven't optimized because I can do better by shifting my taxes to the market with the lower deadweight loss per dollar raised. All right? Now, another way to think about the Ramsey rule is to write it down in terms of elasticities. So... This involves marginal deadweight loss, marginal revenue. I'm going to solve for marginal deadweight loss. All right? Remember, we derived deadweight loss before. Remember in the triangles? You guys laughed at the triangles. Now, we're speeding up. All right, so I just get the marginal deadweight loss. I take the derivative of this with respect to t. All right, and it turns out that that is just going to be eta times p times q times t, marginal deadweight loss. Now let me solve for marginal revenue. Marge, the revenue is T times P times Q. So ad valorem tax. If I take the derivative of this with respect to T, I'm just gonna have P times Q for a small change. So the, deri the, the ratio of marginal deadweight loss to marginal revenue is just eta times T. Those things cancel, the P and the Q cancel out. So now I can rewrite my Ramsey rule as eta times t is equal to some constant, this lambda, all right? And now what I can do is I can derive another principle of optimal taxation that you're going to see again and again. I rewrite my terms. If I'm satisfying the Ramsey rule, what I have is that the tax is equal to a constant divided by the elasticity. So that is, this is called the inverse elasticity rule, all right? This basically says that the more elastic, so the bigger this number is, the more elastic a market is, at the optimum, the lower the tax is going to be. The tax is inversely related to the elasticity. All right, so another way to think about an optimal tax principle is you want to tax inelastic goods. Now, this is what helps to keep things efficient. But that's not the only thing that you want to think about. As you'll see, the most inelastic goods are the goods that are like necessities, like bread. The problem, what's the problem with that? 
any problem with just loading all the tax on bread. Yes, so also a necessity is something that is going to be a bigger share of income for lower income people. So the most efficient thing runs a counter to this, our goals of equity. Right now this model so far doesn't involve any equity considerations. This is just the most efficient way to raise a certain amount of revenue. So this isn't going to be the end all. But in general, you want to tax more inelastic things. So for example, at the opposite end of the spectrum, in the 80s, they figured that a great way to raise revenue would be to tax yachts. They said they're only rich people use yachts. They're going to buy a bunch. They buy yachts all the time. We see it on this, this TV show, Lifestyle of Rich and Famous. Let's go after the yachts. They hit them hard on the yachts, but they had big elasticity, so people just stopped buying yachts. And so they didn't raise a lot of revenue, and they caused a lot of inefficiencies in the yacht market. Um, and so you want to think about the elasticity when you're deciding what good you want to tax. OK, I talked about this before, but the marginal deadweight loss is proportional to T. OK? And that means we want to spread the tax across a broad base. It's better to have a 1% tax rate on many goods than a 2% tax rate on a few goods, for example. All right, another way, the final way, the Ramsey rule is a gift that keeps on giving. I'm going to rewrite it again. So remember, the change in price was T times P. I look at the formula for eta, and I plug in for delta P, T times P. The P's cancel, and I get this number here. Now, going back to the Ramsey rule, I have lambda equals eta times T. I substitute for eta, and I get the t's cancel, and I get delta q over q. All right, so another way to write the Ramsey rule is to say that the proportional decrease in demand across markets is going to be equated if I'm doing my taxes optimally. So another way to gauge how optimal or efficient a tax system is is to see the proportional change in demand after you implement the system. So you don't want to reduce demand by the same number in all markets. You want to reduce by the same percentage. So the Ramsey rule can also be interpreted as that. <clears throat> all right, so we've ignored a lot of things. The price of one good affects another good. A tax in good one or in, the, in market one could affect market three. There could be cross effects. That makes the math a lot messier, and you still get the same intuition. All right, so... Like I said, it's only dealt with efficiency. We didn't deal with uh, equity. All right, so suppose you have caviar and cereal, and the demand for cereal is really inelastic. Also, it's because it's a staple. Um, you might want to still tax caviar more if it's disproportionately consumed by high-income individuals. So that will cause us to deviate from the Ramsey rule in the interest of um, equity. So you want to, now we have to start weighing something that is not uh, necessarily the expertise of economists, which is how much are you going to value equity versus efficiency? The other thing that makes this work is you need goods that are differentially consumed by the rich and the poor. So if both the rich and the poor consume large amounts of bread, uh, you can't you can't really use that as a means of redistribution by alleviating the tax on bread because you're giving everyone a tax cut. All right, so that gives you a little bit of an idea of one way to think about optimal tax for commodity taxes. <clears throat> now we're going to go to my favorite type of optimal taxation, optimal income taxation. All right, and so now you're going to see a lot more Greek letters and stuff. So you've been warned. All right, so <clears throat> to motivate this, I'm going to start by talking about income inequality. Um, and I'm going to describe or talk about some research that looks at a specific type of income inequality. But you'll see how it's going to be connected to the theory as well. 
So you've heard about the 1%. I guess you also heard about the 20%. So again, apologies if this flies in the face of yesterday's seminar, but the 1% are part of the 20%. So um, <clears throat> part of the reason why we focus on the 1% is in part because of research by some of the scholars here listed. Uh, Atkinson, Alvaretto, Piketty, Saez, Stancheva, they've all looked at different ways of describing income inequality and one summary statistic they've looked at is how much income is concentrated at the upper ends of the income distribution. And they've been able to do that in ways that we haven't before by accessing administra administrative tax data because typically survey data is censored at some point. They don't report income above a certain point and they have poor um, participation by the, mo the highest income people. They're just unwilling to report their income and they're very busy. They don't show up for your survey when you give them a Target gift card. So, but they do pay taxes because they don't, some of them don't want to go to jail. So um, they're much more likely to be recorded in the administrative data. <clears throat> so this body of research has looked at how has the concentration of income changed over time across countries? And also, how does it relate to wealth? So here's a key, sort of a classic graph that got, you know, this literature sort of started, was looking at this U-shaped figure here. This is in the US. This is the top 1% income share, either excluding or including capital gains. OK, and so what you get is that you have in the early 20th century high concentration and through the mid 20th century it goes down and then you see a steep rise again as we get into the 21st century. All right, according to this data. Okay, and part of the reason why they, they, they focus on the top 1% share is that going back historically the data is more sparse and so you only have like certain types of percentiles and this is a consistent percentile that you can measure over time. But we're going to see it's also important in thinking about how you're going to tax the highest earners. So why do we have this concentration of what explains it across places? So one explanation is that there's just technological change. All right, what we call skill bias technological change, which says that certain companies um, basically uh, adapt, uh, develop technology that was very valuable if you had high skilled people working in your firm. And that caused the wages to diverge and, become, and the income to be concentrated in the highest skilled uh, segments of the population. Now that definitely explains some of the inequality growth, but it can't be the only explanation because if you look at countries with similar technology, now a lot of this is comparing different countries, but if you look at countries with similar technology, you see different patterns for very similar technological uh, you know, pa paths, okay? Another question is, is this actual earnings or is this just um, tax avoidance? All right, so if you um, plot the top income shares against the top marginal tax rates, they have a very inverse relation, okay? So they're inversely related and it's uh, very visually, you know, compelling that the top income shares go down when you raise the top marginal tax rate. Now, one question is, is that actually less earnings, less economic activity, or is it something else? And so if it is actually people working less and earning less, then you should see that higher marginal tax rates should lead to slower growth. Now, again, we said it linking tax rates to growth is hard to do because we have so many things going on across countries. These authors compared countries um, and they didn't find strong evidence that the tax, top tax rate is affecting growth. So that's their argument that says that this isn't the main explanation. Another explanation is that the firms and their employees are bargaining over surplus. So the company produces some value they can decide to share it in different ways. And if the top earners demand higher wages, there's some bargaining process that takes place. Now, um, they actually argue that 
The, the evidence may most uh, best support this story here. In this case, when you raise taxes, the top earners have less of an incentive to bargain and demand a higher salary or compensation because it's getting eaten by the taxes. In that case, there's not a difference in the economic, uh, the output of the firm, it's just a difference in how much goes to compensation to its top earners. And when the taxes go down, then the top earners have more of an incentive to be aggressive and to get more of the pie that comes out of the firm. And that is one possible story for this growth and inequality over time. During this part, we have decreasing top marginal tax rates in the US. So there are different possible explanations. Um, let me skip wealth for a second because I want to make sure we can cover everything. So um, another more robust study was then done in this follow-up by Piketty, Saez, and Zuckman. So the previous study just looked at certain types of income and capital income, but it didn't cover the entire uh, amount of GDP in a country or the total amount of output. They weren't uh, accounting for all that was produced in a given year. So you can't have a full uh, snapshot of inequality if you're only using certain subsets of income streams. So what they want to do with these national uh, distributional national accounts is take all of the output in a given year and assign it to different people and see how much inequality there actually is once you take into account for everything. That's including taxes, transfers, public spending. To a certain extent, they try to also carve that up and see how much each person benefits from that. Um, <clears throat> and they can also look separately at the individual level so they can compare things, say, across gender, for example. Now, how do they do this? They have to go beyond administrative tax data. So they also use survey data, and they use national accounts data. So that's where we me measure things at the aggregate level. Um, and they try to take that and then divide it up among individuals. Now, this is ambitious, so it relies on a number of strong assumptions about who who, been, who earns the most from uh, profits at the company level, corporate taxes, how are they, uh, what's the incidence of the, those taxes, who benefits the most from public goods. There's a lot of strong assumptions you have to make, so this is a very heroic uh, task. All right? Um, but they basically look at three types of income. First, basically your pre-tax, so your factor income is going to be national income, labor, and capital. What they call pre-tax income includes flows from your retirement account, so pensions, um, adding back in your payroll taxes, and your wealth, and other types of profits. Um, and then your post-tax income is what the tax system does to either undo or exacerbate inequality. So we subtract taxes, we add in EITC and other transfers, and then government spending, we distribute it to everyone. All right, so here are some pictures. One thing they look at is how did people at different quantiles grow in terms of their uh, annual um, income uh, over this period of, say, 34 years. All right, so this is as far back as their data could go. And what you see is that the pattern of the U shape is kind of preserved in the following sense. A lot of the growth is concentrated at the highest uh, income levels, OK? Um, you see uh, much more stagnant incomes for middle. And then at the lower ranges, you actually see, um, in, in real terms, reduction in average income, OK? Now, the taxes mitigate this to some extent. So there is some redistribution that happens, but there's still just enormous amounts of growth concentrated in the top earners. So they're able to still find concentration in growth at the top. They also can calculate people's average tax rates, taking a comprehensive look at all their sources of income. Okay, and this is where we get the other part of the U. So we had a U shape like this for concentration of income, and you see the inverse pattern for taxes at the top. 
they rose during the early 20th century and then they are somewhat declining during about the second half. On the other hand, the bottom 50%, they just had a steady, more of an increase in their uh, average tax rates over the period. All right, now, this picture is in interesting because this separates out transfers. Where are most of our transfers going once we tax people? Um, and the interesting thing you find here, all right, so um, we're actually, over time, there's been more growth in transfers to the middle class, the middle 40%, than the bottom uh, 50%. Okay, so um, we've actually, our policy has skewed more towards middle class transfers. A lot of these include the mortgage, um, the home interest, the mortgage interest deduction, um, employee sponsored health care is tax subsidized. These are different forms of subsidies and transfers that go towards the middle, middle class. All right, so their calculation comes out to in the top 1%, there's a constant, they, they earn 20% of total uh, national income. After taxes, it goes down to 15%. The top 0.1% has almost as much as the bottom 50% in terms of income. This is not a typo. The top 0.1% earns as much national income as the bottom 50%. The middle 40% roughly earns about 40%. On average, the taxes and transfers are on average progressive. Okay? During the 40s to the 80s, the growth was sort of more equitable. So bottom incomes actually grew more quickly than top incomes. During the last 30, 30 years, the bottom 50% has been stagnant. And actually, the lower 20% has had declining earnings over time in real terms. Taxes and transfers somewhat mitigate this gap. Um, there's been a closing of gender gaps, but mainly for lower income groups, not at the top. Um, and then decomposing the growth in the top 1%, during the 80s and the 90s, it was due to wages. That's kind of related to this skill bias technological change. Their, their skills were being rewarded more handsomely in the market. But during the nine, like after the 90s, it was more so due to capital income. Now, there are different theories as to what it means for the top 1% to be getting a lot more of their income through capital income versus wages. That could mean that now they're just living off their wealth. Okay, that's one interpretation. That's like a Piketty interpretation. There's another set of studies that argue actually what they're doing is they're still working and earning this money they're just labeling it as capital income so there are ways that you can generate income as you would when you're getting paid in wages but make it look like you're getting capital income because it's taxed at a lower rate so that's a very different story than you just living off your wealth um, all right, so there's a counter study that came out by some researchers who also have access to administrative data. They use a different set of uh, assumptions and they argue that the previous study is missing out on a lot of things. And so their top income share goes from 11% to 1%. Okay, so um, they have a drastic correction on the estimates of Piketty and Saez. Okay, but there's a lot of differences between these two studies. Their main argument is that people, the rich, were not making less money in the 60s. Their argument is that during the 60s, there were very high marginal tax rates, and the rich just parked their money in companies until the coast was clear. And once those taxes went down, it makes it look like they're earning more, but they were always that rich. This is the counter uh, story. This is an ongoing debate. All right. So the backdrop is that there's inequality. There are varying views on how much inequality there is. But the question is, how do you 
uh, design a tax system to address this inequality. <clears throat> okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about optimal taxation. And I'm going to try to see how far I can get in 10 minutes so I can leave time to be able to talk a little bit about empirical research. Okay, so here's some notation. So we have a tax system. It's just a function of your earnings. All right. First we have like the safety net. If you don't earn anything, how much will we give you? We call this the demigrant or a lump sum grant. That's basically the minimum. This is actually a basic income. Okay, so this is the lowest your income can get under this tax system. Usually there's some transfer to people who have zero income. All right, now the marginal tax rate is a change as your in tax increases. And the key thing we want to know is how much of your income do you keep at the margin? So that's $1 minus the marginal tax rate. So that's called the net of tax rate, the net of mar marginal tax rate. Another type of tax rate is the participation tax rate. That's like your average tax rate. It lets me know if I go from earning zero to earning X amount or Z amount of dollars, on average, how much do I pay in taxes? So I lose my whole basic income because I'm no longer unemployed. And then I also have to pay taxes when I get to this earning amount. And that total amount as a share of my earnings is, I'm going to call it one minus tau P. So that's your participation tax rate. That just determines whether you enter or exit the labor force. Okay, and then there's something called a break-even point. So if we have transfers, we need to tax people, and if it's progressive, there has to be a point where you cross over from being a net receiver to a net giver. That's called the break-even point. So here's a picture to show you approximately how that looks in the U.S., at least how it looked in 2009. So here's a simple... Representative family, single parent with two children. The 45 degree line would be no tax system. You earn $50,000, you keep $50,000. You earn zero, you get zero. Now, the first layer we can add um, are federal and um, Social Security taxes. Okay, that's going to cause us to be less than 45 degrees. Because now if you earn $50,000, you only keep less than $40,000 because of taxes. All right, so flatter than 45 degrees means that you're not keeping a dollar at the margin. Now, a big thing we have are tax credits. Those are subsidies. And so the EITC actually is a transfer to you at low incomes, and then it phases out. So you actually see if you earn a low enough amount, you actually walk away from the tax system with more than you brought to the tax system. So you have a net subsidy. Now, this person's a break-even person. They've exhausted their transfers, and now they're you know, maturing into a taxpayer, net taxpayer. And then these additional final things are the safety net all the way at the bottom. Welfare, TANF, SNAP, and those things fade out. Now, the thing about the phase-out is that that sort of starts to make your marginal tax rate pretty high. If, you're, if, you're, if your tax schedule is flat, your marginal tax rate is 100%. And you see people actually in this range have a pretty high marginal tax rate. So we, they have a very low incentive to keep earning because they're losing so much in benefits. But we have to phase these out in order to get people into the point where we can take them in revenue. So at some point you have to phase them out. All right, so this is like visually how to think about this tax schedule we're going to try to like derive as the optimal tax schedule. All right, so how should I do this? All right, I'm just going to highlight some quick series of optimal tax results. The first thing is a problem that we can't actually solve in real life because it's, it's an illusion, but it leads us to some conclusions. What happens if people just earn the same amount no matter how much we tax them? Okay, so there's no behavioral response in terms of their earnings. Everybody has a certain amount they earn. No matter how much we tax them, they continue to work. Let's say in that simple case that then all you have utility over is how much you consume. How much you consume is your earnings minus your tax. Turns out the optimal tax in that case is a, has a marginal tax rate of 100%. And what I mean by that is the optimal solution here is to give everyone the same level of consumption. 
It's the flat level of consumption. And that's driven by the fact that there's diminishing marginal utility. Basically, you get the most social welfare out of equalizing consumption. So you have basically full equalization no matter how much you work. Um, now, this is very unrealistic because in reality, people will respond by working less. So we're going to move on to what happens when there's a behavioral response. So we're going to build up over a couple of slides. So in order to do that, I need to introduce one final function. It's called the social welfare function. All right, so this is a huge assumption that we're going to make is that the tax planner has some function at uh, G, and it takes as an input everybody's utility. Okay? We're going to assume that it's increasing so that every time someone's in, utility goes up, this function doesn't decrease. So that means you generally want people to be happier. Um, and then you can have different types of social welfare functions. So a utilitarian social welfare, welfare function just sums up everyone's utility. In that case, you don't care who's happier. You just want the, the, the size of the pie to be as big as possible. You can have a Rawlsian social welfare function. There you just look at the minimum utility, and that's the thing you, you care about. So you only care about the, worst pers the person who's worst off in society. That's a strong taste for redistribution. We can have a more general function that is just maybe increasing and concave. That means you have some preferences for redistribution, but you also are happier when anyone is made happier. Okay, and then the most general case is that for each person there's just some weight that we place on them. And then you'll see this weight comes back into play uh, again and again. This is the value to me of giving person in another dollar. Okay, so it's just a relative value that I place on person in. If G is small, I don't care much about you. And if G is big, I really want to redistrib redistribute towards you. So the relative amount that I care about two different people is just dictated by this small g. All right, so a couple of very fast results. Suppose I didn't care about welfare. I just wanted to maximize util uh, revenue. I wanted to be here, the top of the Laffer curve. The tax rate that does that is actually equal to 1 over 1 plus the elasticity of earnings with respect to 1 minus the marginal tax rate. So you get another one of these inverse tax rules. The bigger the elasticity, the lower the tax revenue, uh, revenue maximizing tax rate is. All right, so now you're going to see as I add in more social preferences, I'm basically going to make this tax function become more rich because I'm going to have more things to consider. When you just want to maximize revenue, the only thing you care about is the Laffer curve. All right, now the question is, Suppose I just have one linear tax and I want to maximize social welfare. Turns out that you get this nice expression here. So you can see that it looks like the other function in that it is, still has the elasticity in the, um, the denominator. All right? But I also care on average uh, about the people who um, are being taxed. So. The bigger this G bar is, the smaller my optimal linear tax is. And what is G bar? That's the average weight in the population weighted by how much you're contributing to the tax base. Okay, so the linear tax rate that maximizes utility takes this form here. It's decreasing in the elasticity, and then it's decreasing in the average G. All right? Now, the average G is falling if... I have more taste for redistribution. So the more taste I have for redistribution, the smaller is G bar, which means I start caring less and less about rich people, G bar goes down. And I have a higher tax, so I can do more redistribution. All right, now, let me continue. Now we want to think about a more flexible tax schedule that can have many different tax brackets. The first thing we're going to do is say, what's the optimal tax bracket for the richest people? For example, the top 1%. All right, so I'm just going to go to this, func this uh, result here. So this is the optimum top marginal tax rate. Okay. Apologies for skipping the derivation. 
But you can see that I have a similar form here, but there's an additional term A. So these uh, variables apply to everyone who's earning in the top bracket. Okay, so G, again, is the average social welfare weight for people in the top bracket. The less I care about them, the higher the top marginal tax rate will be. This is the elasticity among all of their earnings in the top bracket. The more they, they will reduce their earnings when I tax them, the less I can tax them. And then A is a term that measures the thinness of the top tail. So if A is smaller, um, so if A is bigger, then the tax rate goes down. Okay, so um, basically, uh, if there are a lot more people concentrated in this top tax bracket, that's going to give me pressure to basically um, reduce my tax rate. Now, you can see that this will actually, um, this nests the previous tax schedule. But I, we don't have time to talk about that. But the nice thing about this formula is that you can plug in values for A. A can actually be estimated. The elasticity can also be estimated. And so what uh, Diamond and Saez did, uh, they looked at um, what the top marginal tax rate would be under different assumptions. So if you don't care about the rich at all, then the top marginal, ta marginal tax rate would be 50%. If you care about them, 50 cents on a dollar. So if you would take a dollar from everyone and it, sorry, if you would, if you're willing to take a dollar and give it to everyone, wait, how does this work? 50%. So giving a dollar to the richest people is, is half as valuable as giving a dollar to the average person. You still care about them somewhat and that brings down the top marginal tax rate. All right, now, that was the top tax rate. The question is, what should the marginal tax rate be in general? You get this more general uh, formula, but it looks very similar. This G is now slightly different. This is how much weight you place on anyone earning more than that, er that, that earnings level. The more you care about people earning more than Z, the lower the, t the marginal tax rate is at Z. This is still a measure of how many people are above Z, and this is the elasticity of people earning right at Z. So this gives you a very tractable way to, to basically design your whole tax schedule. Um, again, that is the sort of crash course version of optimal taxation. So there's a, lar there's a, lar there's a rich literature, and you'll have access to these slides and other references that will you know, allow you to dive into any of those results that you didn't believe because we didn't derive them. All right, so now um, for the grand finale. So <clears throat> I'm not going to be able to talk about all these things, but one thing I want to do is let me, I'm going to spend less time on EITC because I'm going to just be able to focus a little bit on some of the research I do. So. Um, as I mentioned, the Earned Income Tax Credit, it's a tax credit to low-income households. It's an annual tax credit. It's based on how much you earn in a year. Now, um, it is very um, valuable, but one thing you'll see is that uh, the way it works in the U.S. is that we have uh, basically you get your refund at the end of the tax year. So if you have a bad year in 2018, you have low income, we want to give you the earned income tax credit, but you really don't get it normally until you file your taxes in the following tax season, which is like January or February. So even though you're hit with poor, like an economic challenge during 2018, this, uh, this relief doesn't come maybe possibly 12 months later or an average six months later. So... Um, the reason why we have that is because the way our system is set up is that we take money out of your paycheck throughout the year, that's withholding, that goes towards paying your taxes. And if that ends up being more than what you owe, for example, if you got the EITC, we give you a refund back at the end of the year. All right, so why do we collect all this money up front? Does anyone know why we started doing withholding in the U.S.? Taking money out of your paycheck. 
It's because people are really bad at budgeting generally, so, it, and I could be wrong, but um, it's generally harder for people to think about how much they need to save for taxes versus already having the money not be in their paycheck. Right, right so that's part of it. People previously just waited to the end of the year to pay their taxes. And what would normally happen is if they didn't save, they weren't necessarily evil people, but they just forgot to save and then they just didn't file their taxes. They said, hey, I don't have it. But there was a reason why we really needed money and so we could no longer tolerate that. Does anyone know why we really needed money? Probably a war. We were at war. We weren't at war with Donald Duck. Donald Duck was on our side, but <laughs> we had to encourage people to pay taxes and so we introduced withholding and that basically encouraged many more people to pay taxes. Um, normally, the way it works is that you, you actually end up withholding more than you need to, and so you have every incentive to file your taxes to get some of your money back. Now, you don't have to, that doesn't have to be the way it is, but that's the default. Now, here's an example of how withholdings are used by politicians. So in California, in 2009, they raised withholdings by 10% during the year. They had a budget shortfall, but they didn't want to raise taxes. So they basically borrowed money from people, they raised withholdings, and then those people were going to get a bigger refund at the end of the year. Um, so this was like a payday loan. Basically, they said, we're just going to start taking more money out of the payrolls, and then next year, our budget is going to be worse because we're going to have to pay everyone back, but at least we'll look good for the short run. Many taxpayers didn't know that you can opt out of this. So I don't know how many people know this, but you can change your withholdings. There's a form you fill out, and it allows you to change your withholdings. So this, is three, this highlights three observations. Income tax withholdings are not very salient. All right, so a lot of taxpayers don't pay attention to their withholdings. They don't know how they're determined. They just think that it's an automatic thing. Lawmakers can use this to their advantage. And the effects vary dramatically based on how much you pay attention to your withholding. In particular, people with less knowledge of the withholding system may be more likely to have bad outcomes. All right, so now you don't want to underwithhold because if you don't withhold enough, then you're going to owe money plus a penalty. So there's a balancing act. You kind of have to calibrate things. Um, and so in 2016, you find that 73% of people had withholdings, averaging about $2,800. All right, so overwithholding is safe. You don't have to owe a penalty, but it's also costly. This is basically putting $2,000 in a bank account with zero interest. And it's particularly bad if you are borrowing on a credit card at a very high APR or taking out a payday loan. You're basically borrowing at a high interest rate where you have money that you could have used instead that's tied up with the government. So it could be costly for people who either have expensive debt or don't have access to credit. So if your car breaks down, you could have really used that money to fix it but it's kind of with the government. Now, another reason why you don't want to underwithhold is maybe you're just worried about uh, owing, or it could be that you want to force yourself to save. So this is another story that people say, that it, this is a forced savings mechanism, that people use this to buy a new car or to move to a new apartment, and if they had the money on hand in every paycheck, they would just squander it. All right, so people... The one, one thing that I did in some research on was to look at withholding, and what I found is that whatever the story is, people don't seem to adjust their withholdings much. So all of these stories involve like a strategic decision to be made, but in practice what you find is that people are very inert. Um, so here's one thing to look at. This is the distribution of refunds. So this is you owing money, and this is you getting a refund. You can see that Things are skewed over here, and you actually see a huge spike at zero for different reasons, but people are biased towards having refunds. So I did a study to look at whether there's evidence that people are actually actively managing their withholdings to optimally balance their risk versus their forced savings motives versus other possible explanations. And so I used what I found to be what I regarded as natural experiments, where there's a change in how much you should be withholding that is very evident, and the question is how much do people change their withholdings? So here's an example. 
I looked at using tax data, what happens when either you have one less dependent or you have one more dependent. So that could be that you had a childbirth or a child moved out or maybe something bad happened to the child. But when you lose a dependent, your tax liability goes up because you're no longer claiming them on your tax return. So it's very predictable that you're going to start owing more in taxes. And when you gain a dependent, you start getting tax credits that cause us a sharp reduction in how much you owe because you can start claiming that child. So this is a somewhat knowable thing that you should now change your withholdings. So this is what happens to your tax liability. But if you look at withholdings, so this is time zeros when your child, the number of children change. This is the time before. This is the time after. The withholdings do not change very uh, sharply. So here your tax liability went um, up, so you should be paying more. Here your tax liability went down, so you should be paying less in withholding. And you see that there's like a slow adjustment. All right, so people only seem to partially adjust, if not much at all. Um, let me show you another example is the earned income tax credit. So we expanded the EITC dramatically during the 90s for certain groups of people. People with two kids had a big boost in their EITC. People with one kid had a smaller but sizable boost. If you had no kids and you were low income, uh, you had a very tiny boost. And then there are some people who aren't, in, aren't eligible for some reasons. So their tax credits are very flat. So if you are getting this huge credit, your tax liability is being decreased significantly. So you don't have to withhold as much. But what you actually find is that the withholdings for these groups, they decrease somewhat, but not dramatically. And in fact, they don't necessarily decrease that much more than the ineligible people who have similar characteristics. So the EITC recipients seem to be the most uh, unresponsive to these types of incentives. Their withholdings seem to be pretty passive. So they're ripe to have very large refunds. And their timing of their tax transfers is going to really be dictated by whatever the default is. The default currently is to get a big refund. Now, I'll show you one last figure. So there are policy proposals that say we could help people smooth their consumption by instead of giving them the refund once a year, giving it to them every quarter or every month. That would be a smoother payment. There would be less of this overwithholding. There'd be more money on hand for emergencies potentially. On the downside, you may not want to do that because then you're going to spend it all. And if you were using this for forced savings, that's not a good uh, outcome for you. So we have been doing a study. Currently, we're just hypothetically asking people, would they be interested in a periodic payment versus a once a year payment? And previous research shows that people are very reluctant to adopt this, even though economic models would suggest that you should want your money earlier, and if you need to save it, you can just save it on your own. But in general, if you're going to go into debt throughout the year, you might as well just have a lower refund and use your money instead of going into debt. But you find surprisingly low interest uh, or willingness to take this type of offer up. So that's puzzling. But one thing we notice is that when those people are asked, it's usually during the tax season when they have their refund in their hand. So if you're asking someone, you just got a big refund, feel like a million bucks, how would you like to not have this euphoria and instead have a, you know, a much more less exciting monthly payment that's more stable and prudent? And so the question we asked was, would people's answer to this question change if we asked them at different points in the year? For example, in the summer or the fall, now that you've spent your refund, do you have a different view of what might be a good option to have that money earlier, to have it more spread out? So we asked people, did you prefer the lump sum or a monthly option? And during the tax season, there was very low interest. And a monthly option, 
But when we asked in May, the interest increased. When we asked in September, the interest increased even more. So at least some suggestive evidence and, uh, that people um, might change their mind about how they view these different options as the year plays out, and maybe they realize it would have been good to have some of this money earlier or more spread out. Another surprising thing is that we found if we gave them framing, so what we said is, would you rather have money in the summer for vacation or a payment in the fall for back to school? And when we framed what you could potentially use the money for, we then found an even greater, in, um, less of an increase, but more of a baseline interest. So the, um, the framing and asking, telling people what they could potentially use a, a quarterly payment for also had an even bigger um, effect on uh, interest or demand for this product. Um, all right, so. 1230, so I didn't get to get through all my slides, but um, I will share them with you guys so, you know, uh, you can continue to page through them. But thanks for, uh, thanks for uh, the morning, and uh, I enjoyed uh, sharing with you guys.